Yorkshire legends and folklore with Shannon. You're listening to Brothers of the Serpent podcast. Hey, girl. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents to a Brothers of the Serpent podcast coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube of science nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed high atop the Edwards Plateau. Now, I think we got a great show for you guys this week. Uh, we were joined by one of the snake force from the Discord, Shannon, and she told us uh, Yorkshire legends, mythology, uh, and folklore, and we talked about some of her personal experiences and her impressions of the area around where she lives, and about all the ancient monuments and lots of lots of cool stuff, you know, uh, old myths, uh, giants, dragons. Yeah. So yeah, sounds yeah. like a really cool place to to go check out. Yeah, I'd love to go visit that place. Yeah, absolutely. So that'll be coming up and uh, starting in the second segment. Uh, but for now, we what do we got agriculturally? So we did uh, the blend and then bottling. Yeah, we bottled uh, 160 cases yeah. on Friday. Yeah. I thought we could do the whole thing, and no. Nope. nope. So we still have to do more tomorrow. 12 and a half hours in, it was like, ah. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, but it's really good. The blend went well. Yeah. Uh, kept the oxygen levels down, and uh, yeah. I, thought, I don't know if we talked about that last week. We did a little bit. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think we have... What did we figure out? Like a hundred more cases to do? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, two hundred and seventy-five gallons. Yeah, <laughs> in that other tank. So. Yep. Yeah, so we'll be trying to knock that out tomorrow, and then the bottling will be done. And I think we were we were discussing this on Friday when we were doing it. We're like, this is probably the largest batch uh, that we'll ever have to do like this by hand with yeah, our bottling yeah. bottling manually. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we have a we have a little a bottler bottling station, um, but it is manual like it's it's mechanical assistance, but you know it is an automatic. So you have to put the bottles in and take them out, and then we have a corker that puts one cork in at a time. So every bottle has to be basically manually corked. Nineteen hundred and twenty bottles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> corked one at a time. So uh, yeah, it was a it was a lot of work, and we're gonna finish it tomorrow. And then and old Johns from France helped us out. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> which is Ty's new nickname. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Johns from France. <laughs> <laughs> He's working at the tasting room, and he introduces himself as Johns from France. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so he helped us out, and. Um, yeah, we got a lot done, but there's still, I don't know. I think we got two thirds of it done, basically, right? Yeah, it's about yeah. what it was. So we got we got the rest to do, and then that will be done. And then uh, and then we it got just, more. F- the fruits ripening up. Uh, yeah, I don't remember what the last latest numbers were, but it's getting up there. We harvested a little bit of the white. I think I may have talked about that too. No, because that no. was Friday or Thursday. That was Thursday. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, so. So harvested, we have the, small, harvested the white grapes, yeah. The a tiny egg. little row of white, of white grapes that are mature from when we first started planting, and uh, they were ready, so harvested those and crushed them up, pressed them off, got them in a tank, hopefully fermenting by now. Yeah, hopefully. Um, but, yeah, we made three cases of that white last year, and it was really good. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yep. Not for sale. <laughs> no. <Nope. laughs> All right, what about Dynasty? You guys have found a new interesting tool. You want to talk about that a little bit? or? Um, well, we're we're still just like, uh, you know, looking to get multiple different mixes from different uh, professional mix engineers. We've got one really good one uh, that's come back from, from one of our uh, engineers, and we've got some notes we're putting together just to make some minor changes. Minor fixes of certain things, and uh, that's really really great. And we've also found a website. Well, the our drummer Chris found this website called SoundBetter.com, and you can basically hire um, top tier professionals in the in the music industry, uh, musicians, session musicians, uh, mixing engineers, producers, mastering engineers. 
they have profiles on this site and you post a job and they can contact you or you can contact one of them specifically. And so we've got, uh, I think we've got three contracts going for test mixes with yeah. three different That's engineers really, on that site, which is great. Really cool. You can see they're, you know, st- like some of these guys are Grammy award winning engineers. They've worked on very like major projects uh, of bands that we like. Um, the bands that we like the mixes of and their styles are similar or, or, you know, just things like that. So yeah, we're waiting for those to come back. One of them's going to be in like two or three weeks because the guy's busy. Yeah. Uh, one of them should be anytime. Um, and, uh, I don't know what the other, anyway, we'll see when they come back, but it's, uh, it's really exciting to be able to, to just directly contact these people, um, look at their portfolio listen to some of their mixes and send them stuff and deal directly with them it's just great yeah so it's a it's a good site soundbetter.com yeah that's really cool you were kyle was telling me about this yesterday as first i had heard of it i'm like man this is it's awesome and i think it's a sign of how the industry is changing right yeah. it's just you know it's it yeah you have access to these people who are <clears throat> top of the industry if they're if they're putting themselves out for hire you can get a hold of them mm-hmm. directly. Yeah, that's really And cool. it's great. And in some cases, you know, I mean, we had one guy who he charges basically a thousand a song and he just came back. He listened to our, our rough mix and he came back with a much lower price. Oh. It's like, here you go. Wow. Yeah, I'll do it for this. You know, so it's, it's cool. Um, and, and you can negotiate with them. Like I think Chris talked one of them down a little bit or just told him what our budget was and. Um, they came down on the price because they wanted to do it. Yeah. So that's that's promising. Yes, that is. All right, there you go. Agricultural update, rock and roll update. Yeah. Yeah. Now we do uh, Space Weather News. Yeah. Oh, I didn't hit record on that track. Uh-oh. Come on. Let's, let's, let's try this again. There we go. <laughs> Space Weather News from spaceweather.com. Dense solar wind. A dense wave of solar wind just crashed gently against Earth's magnetic field. This could be the ripple from a passing CME, one of several that left the sun in late July, expected to miss Earth by a short distance. High-latitude photographers should be alert for auroras and night sky exposures on August 2nd and 3rd. Oh, that reminds me. Yesterday was your birthday. That's right. It was. August 1st. Happy late birthday, Brent. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Where's the cake? Um, it's still <laughs> over there in the Sphinx. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> this is your permanent cake. For <laughs> here. So uh, current conditions, and you can see these current conditions are due uh, to this dense solar wind that's hitting us right now. Solar wind speed is 412.8 kilometers per second, but the mm. density is 26.3 protons per cubic oh, centimeter. Man. And uh, surprisingly, current sunspot number is zero. And uh, neutron count today is 9% above the space age average, which is rated as high. And the KP index is 5, which is rated as stormy. And the 24-hour max is also at 5. Stormy. So the sunspots disappear and a solar wind starts a blazing. A CME from a like CME the middle from... of the month. Is that what it said? Oh, oh, no, I'm sorry, the it, end of the month. Because it takes a long time to get here. Is that what the deal is? Yeah. Yeah, the, the heavy yeah, particles takes days. take a long time. So yeah. we had a sunspot that you know, is CME activity, and now that sunspot's gone. Yeah. Or it's, a, it's rotated around the... I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, it, well, I mean, they're saying the sunspot number is zero. I don't think that just means the facing side. You it's sure? just there's zero sunspots. Yeah, maybe it is only the facing know? side. If they got something on the other side checking it out? Maybe they do. Yeah, the... Um, there are, yeah, I think there are cameras that are, hmm. that's a stereoscopic, but okay. may, yeah, I mean, I don't know. There could be sunspots on the other side that they don't know about that haven't shown up on the face yet, on the facing side. Uh, but like, yeah, so it says uh, the CME left the sun in late July. So yeah, the the light gets here in eight minutes. The yeah, heavier heavy particle, particles, the heavier particles that are relativistic get here, you know, a little bit, take a little longer, and then the... Like the plasma gas that isn't relativistic, that's you know that's moving hundreds of kilometers per second, takes a lot longer to yeah. get here. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. 
And so I think that is that the first stormy KP index we've had. I think had? so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think so as well. So there you go. That's your space weather news. Old cycle 25 getting going. Yeah. And uh, let's tackle some emails here real quick and before we get into the, the interview. Uh, okay, so this first one is from Tyrone. It's called Wim Hof's Prophecy, Holographic Breathing, DMT, and REM Sleep. Hmm. It says, hello, fellow snakes. I'm sure you've heard of Wim Hof. <laughs> this is true. Uh, for the listeners, this is a guy with several endurance world records who can withstand freezing cold and injected neurotoxin by doing a breathing technique that allows others to do the same things he can. Obviously, the connection between ancient man and the cold is where you would think I am taking this since Wim Hof places a lot of emphasis on ice baths to strengthen the mind and body. But the interesting gold nugget I have found is that his breathing technique mimics the breathing done during REM states. When a person is dreaming. Hmm. I can't find the study to summarize it. During REM sleep, there is a very there is very fast periods of hyperventilation, followed by no breathing for a long time, perhaps 30 to 90 seconds. The kicker is Wim Hof has talked about the spirit realm. He knows how to enter and how it is not for us, but he has been to the DMT world. There appears to be evidence we enter this realm nightly, and it's actually a requirement of human existence to visit the DMT, DMT realm nightly. This may explain why the beings are always familiar and you get nostalgia. I don't know what this all means in the long run, but you guys should discuss psychedelics more. People seeing greys during trips and in dreams snake out. Hmm. So yeah, I think that idea that the dream world is a necessary component to like human existence. I, I agree with that statement, whatever, whatever it means, you know, I think dreaming is necessary. Um, whether you're visiting a, an entirely other realm or not, I don't know, but it's but it's possible. Yep, two times within a week, I was awoken at two thirty in the morning from a dream, and each one was delivering some piece of information. It was very strange. Oh, this happened. Um, I guess the week before and then last week, but you know, within a week between the two dreams and the first one, <sighs> I'm standing next to this guy who is, um, he's doing magic basically. And he's making this building appear up on this hill and it's all lit up. Like the building is sort of made of colorful light and it's, he's just constructing it, right? He's sitting there doing it. And I, I'm, I, I'm looking at him like, okay, so what are you doing in your mind? Like what, what is actually going on in your mind that allows you to, to do this magic? Yeah. Right. And uh, he hands me, the, like he gives me these little, look like, um, like coriander, sort of like herb, like little balls. Mm. Right. Uh, and maybe they even look like, I don't know, but it looked like some kind of spice. Yeah. But they're little BB sized balls. Okay. And he says, um, this is, uh, pine. Let me think. I, I wrote it down cause I woke up right after this. Oh, saccharides. Right. What? So this comes from pine saccharides. <laughs> And then he shows me the molecule, like I see the molecule structure and it's like, it has to be this straight molecule without any of the, of the protuberances on the sides. Yeah. You can't have anything sticking off the sides. And so it's like this straight sort of column shaped molecule. Okay. And that's what I woke up with. Like I'm, I just come out of the dream at 2.30 in the morning and I'm just like, it was so vivid that I was like, I got to write this down. I don't know what this means. So I wrote down pine saccharides. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever heard that word before? Well, I looked it up the next day and of course, like saccharin is a sugar. Okay. Yeah. But I looked up pine saccharides and I couldn't find it, but there is a pine tree called sugar pine. Hmm. But there's sac like like um, disaccharides, monosaccharides. Hmm. 
Yeah, does that sound familiar to you? No. The sugar terms for sugar? <laughs> no. Types of sugar? So, yeah, I don't know. I'd never heard of pine saccharides, yeah. obviously. So I'm just like, what? Like, yeah, how, where did this where come did from? Where did this come from? <laughs> and you asked him, like, how are you doing magic? And yeah. he hands you these. And he hands me these and he says they're pine saccharides. <laughs> I'm detecting a for science moment. <laughs> we got to do it for science. <laughs> This is how you do magic, folks. Kyle may have just released the secrets of the universe to the to the <laughs> podcast there. <laughs> and then I'm trying to remember what the other one was. I don't think I wrote it down. I called Daniel, though, uh, after the second one. Mm -hmm. Woke me up at 2.30 in the morning with a new piece of information. Wow. Total, something totally different. Man. Yeah, this is new to me. You didn't. Yeah, I forgot to tell you about it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, holding back. Here, the holding snake back facts. the snake facts, buddy. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> I'll try this to remember. This just happened like last week. Is that yeah? This is in like okay. So the first one was the week before last, uh. and then within a week of that one, what maybe five days, I had another one. Wow, man, that's wild. I think you got to. I'm trying pursue to that. remember what the other one was. Um, well. I don't remember what it was. I, I remember what happened after I woke up, but there was a piece of information that was in the dream. That I, I don't remember the dream, and I didn't actually remember the dream. Mm. But the second one, when I woke up, there was this piece of information in my head, and I'll, I'll remember it, hopefully. Yeah. And when I do, I'll write it down. Okay. But yeah, that one was really weird because after I woke up and I had this piece of information in my head, I sensed and saw these beings outside the house that were like circling around the house and they were looking in. Wow. They couldn't get in. And I was, I laid there paranoid for a little while. Like, are they getting in? <laughs> Whoa. But they weren't. And so it's, I always have like the knee jerk reaction that like whatever that being is out there or something, you know, yeah. it's like, oh, it's evil. It's right. powerful. It's evil. Yeah. But I, I don't know. I was thinking about that later. It's like, you know, I don't know if that was, if it was good or bad. Yeah. It's just the sensation of a powerful man being out there. Just looking in, not with eyes, but with yeah. the mind. Right. You know? Uh, so yeah, I can't, I wish I could just, terrible i can't remember what the piece of information was but that was the one i didn't write down like a moron hmm. anyway that was really strange uh dream world experiences yeah. recently and i haven't had a lot of dreams recently so that was pretty cool yeah wow well I, i'm glad that i'm hearing it first on air that's great <laughs> <laughs> are you being sarcastic <laughs> no i'm just like wow i don't even know what to do with it that's a really that's really interesting because yeah you've been telling me like i'm not having these you know, yeah, dreams. So, what have you been doing different? You know, you need to summon these. Those things. both of those nights, I went to bed early. Oh, right. I was trying to go to bed early so I could get up early, mm -hmm. like super early. And I just, I don't know. So by the time the witching hour rolled around, you had already had a lot of sleep. I basically. guess so. Okay. Yeah, two thirty. Yeah, in the morning. All right. Well, let's let's see. We got. Uh, <clears throat> This is from Rob. This is called Mayans in Georgia, question mark. Says, hey, Snakos, I'm way behind on your podcast, but I'm loving the Gods of Eden episodes. Bramley, I think, gets a lot of stuff wrong, but enough of that. How about a Mayan colony in the U.S. state of Georgia? Sounds like bunk to me, but it's interesting nonetheless. I don't see why they couldn't get to Georgia, so it's at least in the realm of possibility. Essentially, there's a pyramid straight to it, or a pyramid-like site at a place called Trap Rock Gap in Georgia. I'm assuming that name is related to the oil industry. Uh, archaeologists think it's a North American Ameri Amer Amer Indian, Amer Indian location where a hill was at least partially reworked into a more pyramid-like shape. There's apparently plenty of mysterious stoneworks, petroglyphs, pottery shards, and other sundries to fit right into the podcast theme, even if the Mayan connection doesn't pan out. The whole site was abandoned suddenly as well. The Mayan connection seems to mostly be the pet project of a guy named Richard... Thornton. Thornton. He makes the connection largely on some old maps that label some places in the area uh, Itzate, and that the Mayans sometimes called themselves the Itza Maya. I don't buy it, but like I said, mysterious stoneworks in an abandoned ancient city sounds snaky enough. 
I bet Thornton would do an interview too. And recalling that you guys have spent some time in Georgia, you might have something to add or might know people who could fill us all in as well. Anyway, keep on snaking on, Snake Bros, from Rob. Cool, man. Yeah, I have heard of this possible Mayan pyramid in Georgia. I don't know anything more about that. Um, he does provide a link here to Archaeology News Network. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I also think it's definitely possible. And then we were just talking to Kyle, you know, last week about the possibility of his people coming up from oh, down yeah. in Guatemala and being connected to the Maya. So if that's true, then the idea that some Mayans may have ended up in Georgia building Mayan-like pyramids is a definite possibility. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So, um, yeah, thanks for the thanks for the email, buddy. And uh, I think that's the only emails I'm going to read today because we have we had a one-up box. So I need to read this note. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yes, the one-up box was full of cookies, which we tried. They were delicious. Thank you so much. Oh, so yeah, this buddy. is, yeah, this is the note here. This is from Alan. Right? Yeah. He says, uh, hey, dear brothers of the serpent. Hello. My name is Alan Normandon, and I am from Minnesota, and I don't care about being doxxed. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I have just completed listening to every episode, and like most who do, I feel a sense of emptiness that comes when there aren't any unheard episodes left. <laughs> it took me about two and a half months to listen to them all. So except for your book reports, I listened to the episodes like a countdown all the way to number two. My indicator of how much time had passed was the 10 most recent episodes you had posted. Podcasts are how I consume information. I'd rather be listening to a podcast than watching TV. I used to listen to other podcasts, but since going on my serpent's journey through the back catalog, other podcasts pale in comparison. Eh, thank uh, you, thanks, man. Thanks, buddy. <clears throat> Odds are I will probably start listening to all of them again and start at number two. And once I get above episode 30 or so, I can finally listen to them with my daughter, who's five years old. <laughs> Jeff, in the that. Jeff in the Discord was right. The early episodes do get a little vulgar. I think it's closer to 50, but yes, <laughs> you better wait till 50. Uh, he says, I want to thank you for all the content you've shared with us all. I have recently become a contributor to the Snake Bros Pyramid Scheme, and I am paying you guys, guys the difference for all the hours of brain expansion. I believe I began listening in January, but to be honest, the time before Snake Bros is hazy. <laughs> <laughs> My handle on the Discord is smash you two smithereens, and my pick is Yosemite Sam. I would love to be more active in the community, but I am a husband, a father, a boss, a homeowner, and a fledgling entrepreneur. I do not have free time. Any and all of my free moments, I spend meditating. With everything going on in my life, it's hard to keep up with the Discord, but the times that I have been on there were quite enjoyable. Jeff and the rest of the community are awesome and helpful. I am a chef by profession, and baking cookies is my passion. I have an insatiable flavor curiosity. I have close to 300 recipes of flavors that I have tried. Anything that I thought might be unique, I have tried. For years, my coworkers have told me that I should be selling them. So this summer, with the help of my amazing wife, I've been baking large quantities of cookies and selling them at the local farmer's markets. It has been a success. I want you to know that most of the time I have spent baking cookies, Brothers of the Serpent episodes were being played. So included in the package are two of the varieties that I sell. I thought that the red wine dark chocolate would interest you guys. And the Belgian chocolate chunk is the classic chocolate chip cookie. If you guys or your family mem members have any favorite flavors, I would be more than happy to send more cookies to you guys. So, have you guys ever heard of Tartaria? <laughs> I decided to wait and listen to every episode before asking just in case it had been mentioned in the past. I have not heard it brought up. From what I gathered, it was a globe-spanning empire that was still around in the 1800s, and then it was completely wiped from existence. I have heard podcasts discussing that the world's fairs and the great fires that destroyed many major cities in the 18 and 1900s were to cover up and erase Tartaria from history. When you guys talk about the Carrington event and how that destroyed much of the communication lines, it made sense to me that it was the catalyst for the takedown of the Tartarian Empire, if it ever existed. I use the Podcast Addict app, and I have left a review there to support you guys, so keep up the great work. Snakes! From Alan. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and yeah, he sent cash. That's right. <laughs> In the amount yeah, he of, said it was uh, to make for up seven for... seven months. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, he signed up to the Patreon... And it, the, yeah, the cash envelope is called What You're Owed. <laughs> so he's on Patreon at a specific level, and he sent all the um, the back cash where he was listening and not paying. So thank you so much. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Yeah. <laughs> really appreciate that. And yeah, the cookies were fantastic. They were really good. So I have them up in the tower now, 
And uh, I am on a diet, so I will be eating them one at a time once a week. <laughs> so it may take me a long time to get through all those cookies. Yeah, I did like the the Belgian chocolate chunk. Those are my oh, yeah. favorite. Yeah, really good stuff. Yeah, the whole family, we all, for my birthday yesterday, we basically opened them up and we all ate some. So yeah. they were really good. Yeah, and the, uh, as for the Tartaria thing, um, I don't know a whole lot about this other than sort of a cursory lookup of the basic idea, like what you said, uh, you know, this civilization being lasting all the way up to the 1800s and stuff. But I did kind of run into a little bit of this in a roundabout way with some of my friends showing me images of Google Earth, like Google Earth images, looking at patterns in the landscape and thinking that they're gigantic structures and buildings and cities and stuff that are yeah. preserved. And I don't buy it. That's just my thing. I'm total skirt tired when it comes to this. Yep. I look at those and I'm like, yeah, I actually recognize those types of geological features. Um, having spent many, many years on landscapes, raw land, clearing canyons, hilltops, seeing the terraces, walking them, um, finding caves in them, and also looking at topography maps. And then, of course, satellite imagery, which was a big part of... Uh, the jobs we would do yeah. on these large ranches. And yes, many times we saw interesting things in these satellite images and we went to those places and it was geological features. That's right. Um, yeah, there was, I mean, how many times were we like, that's a freaking pyramid, you know, let's yeah. go. And, yeah. and, and, and it's not. So what, what, is the, what are these two weird things standing out from the trees right here? Let's go check them out. We yeah. go find them and it's just a couple of boulders, right? It's not, you know, it's not. Yeah, and you would think that, you know, you find a cave into this, you know, quote-unquote pyramid, uh, and you go into it, that, you know, maybe it was an old door or something that would then eventually yeah. fi start finding actually built structures, and no, it's just, nope. it's just caves. It's a cave. Natural stuff. So I don't, I, I can't, and, and seeing patterns in the, the erosional patterns in the landscape um, that look, you know, like faces and things like that, yeah. That's cool, but I still am on the side of this is natural. Uh, there, there doesn't look to be anything unnatural about these formations to me. So that's where I stand on that. And as far as the ability of people and entire societies to completely wipe out an entire civilization that supposedly built vast structures all over the world in the 1800s without us knowing about it and it being pretty like i just i don't know that yeah. it's just no it's kind of it's hard a, to buy it hard, yeah <laughs> not buying it <laughs> so that's that's my perspective and that's why i'm not looking into it i'm not like digging because basically what i've been shown by the people who do who are interested in it is not convincing enough for me to really want to yeah spend time like looking into it so yeah, um, I'm in the same boat. I've seen, I've read some stuff about it, and I've seen the thing, some things, and I'm just like, well, <sighs> number one, not buying it. Number two, it's I don't know. I, I for the most part, I'm interested in more ancient things. I guess. Yeah, but if this civilization like spanned thousands, uh, yeah, of years. was thousands and thousands of years old, and it was just suddenly wiped out, yeah, in the 1800s, like that just seems. I don't know if that's how the story goes. Yeah, but. Definitely, fee, it I definitely. do think that entire giant civilizations can be wiped out. Mm -hmm. Whether that happened in the 1800s and things like f world's fairs and great fires are part of the cover up, I I can't, don't think there's a cover. I can't yeah. really. I don't think there's a cover up. Yeah, I can't really buy it. So, so yeah, you're probably not going to hear us talk about that. But I podcast. do appreciate you listening to the entire back catalog before asking. That's yes. that's really uh, that respectable is, and yes. noble of you, bro. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yes. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so le totally legit question because you did that for sure. So thank you so much for, for doing it that way. Um, and, yeah, uh, thanks for the cookies. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Ready for the interview? Yep. Okay. Well, let's go. All right. Well, I hope you guys enjoy this. And here we go. Snacks!
are back again, Brothers of the Serpent podcast, and I did uh, remember to hit the record button this time. Yeah. And we are very happy to welcome Shannon to the show. Welcome, Shannon. And uh, she's also Wish in the Discord, so if you join the Discord, you can talk to her. That's right. Welcome, and Shannon. Welcome. Yeah. Hi. Nice to be here. Really good to be here. And yeah, the original <laughs> joke that I had when we didn't record it was, what shire are you from? <laughs> I'm from Yorkshire. Yorkshire. <laughs> the, shire, the Shire of York. It is. Yeah. It is. And so, lo- go ahead. Lo- locals here say Yorkshire. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yorkshire. I can do that. Yeah. Yeah. You need to practice that. <laughs> Yorkshire. Practice that. <laughs> Yorkshire. Yeah. So you, uh, oh, how, what was it, months ago, you told me that you, uh, you, you talk to people about folklore you give presentations. And so I was like, man, you need to come on the show and, and do this. And also you have, you have, what did you say? Thousands of ancient sites around you that, you know, so you're able to visit these places. You were posting in the discord. You guys went to, where did you go? You were posting all those pictures from. Oh, the devil's arrows. Yeah. Oh, that was amazing. That place sounds cool. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of places around here. Um, you can't possibly get through them all. So there's 2,600 ancient monuments in Yorkshire. Wow. Which is crazy. Absolutely crazy. And how big is Yorkshire, like approximately? Uh, Is it like the size of a county or, you know, like, I don't know. It's um, the largest county um, in England and it's 2.9 million acres. Okay. All right. Does that compute? (laughs) That's pretty small, I think, I I would say. It's it's relatively speaking for to have 2,000 ancient sites, 2,600 ancient sites. Yeah, um, I didn't do the square feet. I'm afraid. Yeah, uh, maybe the watcher. If yeah, if he was there, he could do it for me. You could yeah. tell us how many Walmart parking lots that was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't really think about that because I just think, well, we're the biggest county, so that's all that matters. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, it's. Uh, I don't. You know. You know how big. Britain is it's teeny yeah it like fits into one of your you know cities probably um and I think maybe sometimes I think that it's a lot bigger than they tell us it is mm. um but I don't, I don't know I'm not very good with scale <laughs> right so, um but like if if you drive an hour here that's like forever oh Whereas man in the, yeah Whereas in the States, you're like, go an hour just to go somewhere for lunch. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Whereas here, it's like you're going into another world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, you yeah. know, that, that kind of rings a bell. And here I'm going to bring up some science fiction that I read a long time ago about uh, it's like mental distance or something like that. It's it, the, I, the comparison I remember was the difference between driving through a, a very large city versus driving through the desert. You yeah. Know, in the desert, uh, you pass through 70 miles in an hour, going 70 yeah. miles an hour. And it's just like it's just an hour. And it, it basically it, it breezes right past. But in a city like, you know, for New York City, going 70 miles is a long yeah. freaking way and takes you a long time because there's so much stuff. Right. It's so yeah. busy. Yeah. So, yeah, there is this strange time paradigm here for sure. Um yeah, everything just is slower and takes longer. I don't know. Hmm. It's a very strange place. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so Yorkshire. Um, so I think why I'm fascinated and passionate about Yorkshire is because I'm not from here, obviously. Well, I kind of am. Um, my mom and my mom's family are from Yorkshire, and my dad's side is from originally California. Um, So it was a strange blend. But people who are from Yorkshire, I think there's a lot of trauma here, you know, like past trauma. And I have a bit of a timeline of the history here. I mean, it is is crazy. You know, going back to 8,000 BC, it's just up, down, up, down, up, down. And I think they have that memory. You know, I know you guys talk about that kind of ancestral memory that you have. Yeah. so people from Yorkshire always are like, why do you live here? Are you crazy? <laughs> you know, wh- wh- you don't want to live in America? And I'm like, uh, you know, you, you're from Los Angeles. I mean, why don't you go back to Los Angeles? I'm like, 
because it's nice here in Yorkshire. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no offense to Los Angeles, but it's like, I think I started to defend it and going, what are you talking about? It's beautiful. It's like, we have great, you know, air quality, you know, it's green and lush. And I know it's a little bit rainy, but, um, you know, I think, I don't know. I just, over 30 years I've lived here. So I absolutely kind of found my pla- myself in a place where I would, I would want people to realize how lucky they were to live here. Oh, yeah. Mm. And I'd be like, have you been to Los Angeles? And they're like, no. <laughs> I'm like, well, then, you know, maybe don't ask me or don't assume that it's better. Um, <laughs> and then the other thing was when I go to the States to see my family, obviously I sound American um, more so when I'm there. And they're like, oh, you don't live here. And I'm like, oh, no, I live in England. They're like, oh, London, London's fantastic. <laughs> right. Such a great city. And I'm like, I don't live in London. They're like, huh? <laughs> They're like, have no clue that there's anything outside of London. <laughs> no offense to Americans. Yeah, I don't know, live in Americans. London. I thought you said you lived in the UK. <laughs> yeah. There's just, there's just London. That's it. Yeah. Um, so I'm like, no, I actually live in the north of England. And they're like, huh? And then they lose interest. Because wow. it's like. It's they, not a city. Yeah. It's wow. Like, you know. Yeah. So that was the other, the other reason. So I'm super passionate about where I live. Um, so it's a very rural area? It's a very rural, um, but then we have our big cities. Okay. Don't ask me how big they are. Well, please. I don't, yeah. Watch her. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you've probably heard of York. Yeah. Uh, the city of York. Um, and there's there's fascinating history about the city of York. Um, so I kind of... Now, New York, I thought New York was named after York, but it wasn't. It was named after the Duke of York. Yeah. But maybe the Duke of York was named after York. I don't know. <laughs> um, so uh, people associate York with the Vikings and the Romans. Um, but the biggest Celtic tribe in the UK was based here in Yorkshire. It was huge. And it was actually bigger than Yorkshire is now. It took up Northumberland and I think part of Lincolnshire as well. Um, and they were the Brigantes. Brigantes. So that's all fast. The, the, the Brigante tribe, yeah. Mm. Um, and there were some kick-ass queen, queen, Celtic queens too, which is interesting because you so don't often hear about them. Are they the ones responsible for building a lot of the monuments, do people think, or no you one know knows? What? You know what? They – you guys know they they speculate on the dates. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so the the Devil's Arrows, um, a place I visited a few months back now, um, that's that's near the the original capital of the Celtic tribe, which is a town called Albra. Um, and those alignments. So there's quite a few monuments there, and um, we've got Marty in the Discord who's doing some phenomenal field work and you know remote research on those places in Yorkshire um so you probably better asking him about specifics but there's I don't know how long the alignments go from north to south or east to west um but there's the three biggest henges um earth mounds sorry earth mounds at Thornborough and then the biggest I think in Europe and then there's stone circles and stone monoliths um, all along, all the way to the coast wow. here in Yorkshire. Hmm. Um, it's a phenomenal kind of line on the on the map. Um, so there's some fun, there's just amazing places here. It really is. But the landscape here is is also just epic. It's like you see the ice age everywhere you go. You oh, know, man. around you just see the effects of all all the all the ice ages yeah um i think yorkshire is formed over 230 million years the landscape wow so it's just it's rolling hills and valleys and vales and it's um green and but then limestone just outcroppings and i mean it is there's some crazy terrain here um man so it's i'd quite, love to see it yeah uh, it's just it's unbelievable. Um, 
And people have no, you know, a lot of people have no idea. Yeah. You know, they have no idea what, because they don't see, they don't see the, the formation of it. You know, they don't look at things and go, oh, wow, that must have been, you know, cut by a giant glacier. And yeah, right. You know, yep. And the erratics that are here, I mean, the glacial erratics that are here, I mean, they're just like, what? <laughs> they're just, they're everywhere. You're just like, oh my God, look at that huge thing. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah. <clears throat> so I have specific places that are, um, I think, close to me um, because they're just so phenomenal to look at. And I do have notes on kind of, how they might have been formed and, you know, kind of more, um, the sciencey part of it. Um, and there's a place called Malm Cove and I think you guys have a picture of that. Um, okay. and that is just, that's epic. That's epic, uh, cove. It's like just this sheer. Oh, I see it. Yeah. Tall. I think it's. Yeah. So I'll put I, these just for everybody listening. I will put these pictures in the show notes and, uh, I'll also give them to Brand, uh, Brandon. So he can put them on the YouTube video. Yeah, so it's called Malham Cove. It's M A L H A M, um, and yeah. it's in North Yorkshire. Um, so it's basically a limestone pavement. It's um, glacio karst yeah, in formation. Yeah, wow. Yeah, um, and it was kind of formed in the Quaternary, so anywhere from like two point six million years ago to present. Um, there's no clear consensus on how it was formed um they're always debating it you know and obviously lots of theories um so basically it's like a giant wall and if you've seen game of thrones and you've got the ice wall it's like that mm. but it's it's just sheer flat i mean people climb up it it's a it's a great climbing area yeah um and then on the top it's like rippled from all the water erosion, it looks like kind of like a crazy puzzle. And I've included a link to some drone footage of it. Um, it it's definitely worth looking at if okay. you're interested. Um, so it's like bare faced rock with deep scars, um, like almost like gorges. I mean, it's in, it's insane. Yeah. And I, I didn't actually write how tall it is, but I want to say it's 230 meters, which I know doesn't mean anything to many of you. <laughs> Because totally it doesn't mean much to me. It doesn't mean much to me. Um, <laughs> so that is just an epic place. And it's got water-filled caves. So there's a whole cave system underneath that goes to a lake, which is Malum Tarn, which means lake. Um, epic landscape around, amazing, stunning views from the top. Because you, it's not it's not a hard walk to the top. Um but I have a bit of a strange story about that place. So I think I'll tell that. Oh, yeah. Let's yeah, hear let's it. Hear it. Um, okay. So just let me gather my thoughts. Um, it started, I think I was around 10 or 11. So in the summertime, when I lived in California, we used to come to Yorkshire to visit my grandparents and lots of cousins and aunts and uncles. And then my mom used to take us on day trips you know, so one day we went to Malm Cove and just let me point out that as a kid, my, my father in particular was always a bit concerned because he used to describe me as being fearless. Oh yeah. So I was often taking risks and putting myself in danger because I just wasn't scared. I mean, I am now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm scared of cat now. Um, but my dad would be like, you know, God, you're not scared of anything, are you? I'm like, no, I can do that. I'll jump over there. <laughs> um, and I grew up in the ocean as well. And I was just like crazy. Anyway, anyway, so I I get to Mount Cove and I look up. It's like looking up at a skyscraper. Now I can look up at a skyscraper and I'm fine. But I look up at this sheer face limestone wall and I start freaking out. I literally started to feel nauseous, like almost like vertigo. Yeah. You know, like instead of looking down, I looked up and I had to like turn away and cringe and I was frightened and shaking. And my mom's like, what? What? I think my mom was a little bit stressed out because my brother was maybe like five. 
So she was like, what is your problem? What, what's wrong? What's wrong? I'm like, I don't play. I'm like, I don't like it here. I don't like it here. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) So I was like, even myself, I was like, what's wrong with me? It's like, it's just like a wall. It's like a wall. Um, so yeah, I don't know what that was about. And it is a vivid memory for me. So now I have to go forward in time to 2005. (laughs) I'm trying to tell it quite quickly. Um, oh, take your time. Yeah. So I'm a little bit nervous because I was in a really bad car accident. Um, I didn't get hurt, but the people who almost killed me, they it was a fatal car accident, basically. Oh. Mm. Um, so I was super lucky. My son, Gabriel, wasn't even two. So, you know, you can imagine in those slow moment, slow motion moments that, you know, I was just thinking – holy cow, you know, I'm going to orphan my son right now because of these jerks. Right. Yeah. Um, anyway, after the car accident, I wasn't really good at getting in a car. Yep. I had, you know, I started being anxious. I didn't want to get in the car. Um, it kind of controlled my life for quite a while. Um, I was fine on little trips. So I had, um, some trauma therapy called EMDR. Um, have you heard of it? Mm-mm. No. It's it's used for PTSD and it's it mimics your REM sleep cycle. So the therapist has a long bar with lights on it. And when you're in the therapy, you you're holding these like kind of balls in your hand that vibrate and you're looking at this bar and the lights go side to side. So it's almost like you're being kind of hypnotized, but yeah. you're being guided by the therapist. It's specific. It's um, it's eye movement, desensitization, and reprogramming, EMDR. Okay. Hmm. It's used a lot for soldiers coming back from, you know, and anyone who has PTSD. Um, you caught PTSD there, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was having this therapy. So every week I would have this EMDR therapy and you basically, you're watching these lights go side to side and it's supposed to reprogram. So it's working like when you're in that dream state and you're processing your day. So it's supposed to unstick the traumatic memory so you can move past them without feeling the trauma in your mm-hmm. body. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's hard and it's hard because the therapist is guiding you through and basically, basically she makes they make you go over and over and over and over like every single event of the traumatic event. Yeah. And it was tough. So I think it was about week five and we'd been through it and we were looking at other things um, related to the trauma. And all of a sudden, like, and this is visual, this is a visual physical feeling, like almost like vision a 20 foot giant was throwing me up and down in the air. Wow. In front of Malum Cove. So out of the blue. So this giant was ugly and like an ogre and it was, he was drooling and he had a butt flap on, like literally had a butt flap on. Wow. Um, he was kind of gray skin, um, kind of like the landscape of Malum Cove. And I was a child, so I wasn't me. I was a small child screaming in terror as this giant played with me like a ball, throwing me up so high that I could see down the cove. And then he would catch me, and he was laughing his head off. So this lasted for quite a while. Wow. (laughs) I know, right? What? (laughs) What? What? And meanwhile, the therapist is like, what are you talking about? What are you seeing? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know. And she, I think she, I think I scared her because she had no idea what was going on. And anyway, she brought me out of whatever she, I think she somehow took me somewhere good. Like you have to establish a good thing. So I don't know how long it was after that. And I remembered how terrified I was when I went to mom cove that day. It sounds, I mean, I mean, you know, the first thing I thought of was past life memory or something like that. Right. And then, so you show up there as a little girl in this life 
and you see it and you have this unexplained terror. Yeah. Wow. That's and then years later in that therapy, that memory comes out while you're hypnotized. That's, that's wild. Wow. I know. So I don't know what to make of that. (laughs) Uh, Giants are real. I was just going to say, you beat me. It's proof. Giants are real. (laughs) That's right. Mystery solved. I know. They're real. Get over it. Oh my gosh. So that was a crazy story. Yeah. That's a great story. Wow. Yeah. That was crazy. Um, There's a lot of lore. There's loads and loads of giant lore around Yorkshire. Um, Most of the stories are quite diluted, I think, at this point. Um, Because not a lot of things were written down. Like I was going to compare to the Iroquois, the Iroquois stories where, you know, a lot of things were written down properly. Mm -hmm. I think here um, things just weren't written down that well. Um, So when you read all the stories about giants, you're like, meh, there's some that are good. Um, I mean, I I might read one or one maybe, but... um, And there's some quite famous giants here. And apparently when it's written, it's written that the Yorkshire landscape was created by the giants. Oh. You know, scraping giant stones out of hills and throwing giant stones and littering stones and um, leaving footprints behind. And um, the other funny thing is that I have the Hugh Newman and Jim Vera book. Uh, the Eng- the English version. Well, I have I have both of them, and I can't find it anywhere because I wanted it for my show prep. Oh, Uh-oh. yeah. So <laughs> I know uh, that feeling. I've lost books before too. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, sorry about that. I, I don't know where that book went. Um, so that was annoying. Do you think those are th- those are, you know, we were talking with with Kyle about this too. That like some of those stories may be symbols for cataclysmic events memories of you know like so the giants throwing stones like and you were just talking about glacial erratics being everywhere so that's what i was thinking too you know are they ice giants like we go in you know it's these it's the it's the glaciers that are the giants that are doing all the throwing and scraping and leaving footprints right no absolutely yeah absolutely um but i think i mean personally i mean there's a lot of evidence for giant skeletons here oh yeah i mean there is (laughs) Um, but no, when I've been reading and they absolutely say it's metaphorical. Right. Um, and a a lot of people, I think it can be both, right? Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. And I think a lot of people here feel that the giants, cause I'm like, yeah, but why does every culture in the world talk about giants? Maybe they were real. And they're like, you know, no way. They're just spirits, you know, like nature spirits, like the fae. I'm like, yeah, but they were real, surely. <laughs> and Wait a minute, are people. they trying to say that the Fae weren't real? Come on. Yeah, no, they don't. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Come on. There's a lot. I mean, there's a lot of. There's loads of fairy stories here. And yeah, I I love the <sighs> I love the, the the fairy stories, the Fae stuff, and and you know some yeah. of them. When I was going through that uh, fairy faith in Celtic countries, it's yeah. interesting how when has he moves from area to area that the description of the fae uh physically will change mm. drastically but their actions pretty much always <laughs> remain the same right the stuff that they do yeah. to people right so yeah. in one place they're they're small and they're horribly ugly uh and then in another place they're tall and beautiful and then in another, <laughs> and in another place they're you know they look just like regular people uh, maybe a little bit shorter or whatever, but and yet the the kind of stuff that they do is always the same. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. You know, the the it's it, that makes me wonder like, what are we talking about here? Like, why are the descriptions so <laughs> physical descriptions so different? Yeah, when they're the way that they act and the stuff know. that they say is always the same stuff. It's really interesting. It is, isn't it? Yeah. I have no idea, but I am scared. <laughs> I get scared. scared again. Come on. I know I am. Well, I used to, I used to leave offerings because I'm a huge gardener, and um, I used to leave offerings and you know ask them to protect, you know, because like kids would come along and steal my cabbages and you know stuff like that. So I'm like, you know, please look after, you know. So I would like converse with whatever I thought was there, um, nature spirits. But I think it's just 
diving into all this esoteric stuff and you know some of the stuff I've heard on your podcasts and other podcasts I'm just like scared to death like I think it was I think maybe it was 2007 I started listening like obsessed with the 411 stuff yep that was the biggest mistake of my life (laughs) (laughs) I mean I am so you know like my brother's like oh yeah we're going on a hike you know I'm taking the girls on a hike my nieces are like you know eight and six I'm like I'm like, okay, well, don't wear bright clothing. <laughs> and he's like, what are you talking about, honey? I'm like, so you sure? Okay, what time? You know, tell, you know, just tell someone where you're going. And, and yeah, it, it does like kind of turn you into a scary cat all this stuff. <laughs> you know, I used to go into the woods by myself. Like and yeah. stay overnight and like, just like hang out and sleep under a tree, you know, in my twenties and I yeah. mean, there's no way I would do that now. <laughs> there's no way. So I think it, it is quite sad. Well, you should do it for um, science. Oh, right. You got to do it for right. science. Find out what, what's going on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, good idea. Good idea. <laughs> and I'm sure, I'm sure when um, I've been in this particular wood near me that I have been transported from one path to another and I wasn't taking anything and I don't drink and it was like we were walking along the path and we felt like we had to leave. You know, when you get that feeling we shouldn't yeah. be here tonight mm-hmm. and the moon was a bit creepy and something was – there were other things that were super creepy. And we knew, we knew the way out to, to the river and back to the road. And all of a sudden we were like, how, how did we get here? We were just over there. It, it was like – yeah, anyway, that was weird. Um Oh, like you, so you, you were, you were on a path that you knew and then suddenly you're like, wait a minute, I, I recognize this path, but it's not the one we were on. That's what you're saying. And we were like maybe 10 minutes ahead of ourselves. Oh. Like we were kind of pushed out a little bit quicker than we would have gone oh. Oh, man. just ourselves. <laughs> yeah, and I'll we were little... like, no, 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 yeah, yeah, no, I know. And I was like saying to my friend, uh, is it me or... Or should we, we shouldn't be here yet. And there, she was, so we were both freaking out. Yeah. And so again, you got, we the old, you got the old GTFO nudge there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Luckily it wasn't a doe though. I, you know, a that doe. doe that, the doe that told that lady to. Oh to yeah. Look, yeah. That's right. Looked, we got the email from. Oh the, my gosh. Yeah. Oh my God. That was scary. <laughs> Was so that from the, uh, that was from the. Yeah, that freaked me out too. Yeah. That was from the, oh, was it the captain of the Uinta Snake Force? Or was it Space Ramen Shaman? That I told can't us that remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that yeah, was the, the you into Snake Force guy. He said that, told us that story about the, the deer telling his wife, like, get out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. freaky, man. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, get out. Get out. Yeah. <gasps> yeah. Ah. <laughs> that was scary. That All right. So tell us scary. another scary story. <laughs> okay. It's not scary, but it's weird. So back to the Devil's Arrows um, I were talking about earlier, which is in North Yorkshire. Um, so I went with my my then friend, Chris. He's still my friend, but he's a little bit more than a friend. In fact, that was our first date, but we didn't know it was a date because ah. we were still friends. Anyway, that's another story. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, oh, I really want to go to this place called the Devil's Arrows. And he's like, okay, come on, let's go. We'll take some food and blah, blah, blah. It was a really nice day. And I'd been talking to Marty in the Discord about it and, um, you know, told other people, you know, I'm going to this place. And it's like, I think they're the tallest monoliths in England. Okay, so, so it's actually constructed. It's a, the, the arrows are not a natural. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'll kind of rewind. Mm-hmm. Um, the Devil's Arrows is a site um, and it's three, there are remaining three very tall monoliths. So stone monoliths and they're millstone grit, um, and they're from they're quarried from six miles away. Millstone wow. grit. What's Mil, that? It's called millstone grit. The stone. Okay. Watcher. I'm gonna look it up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean that's stone grit. Uh, it keep, look, continue. Um, yeah, it's not remarkable in any way. Okay, it's, it's a kind sandstone. Of, yeah, coarse, coarse grain sandstone. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, but they have these super interesting grooves that start from the very top and go down like maybe halfway down the monolith stone, the standing stone. Um, and of course, you know, mainstream archaeologists say, oh, it's that's water erosion. But they're like perfectly 
channeled out. Yeah. And there's a picture in my notes. of We're that. looking um, at it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I'm saying, I'm saying to my friend, you know, do you think that's erosion? He's like, well, I don't know, probably. And he's not, you know, he's not on the same page as me with a lot of things. It's not that he, he doesn't buy it. It's just that he, you know, so I'm saying, yeah, th- that doesn't look, that doesn't look like erosion to me. Um, it's too perfect. And it was almost like there had been something beautiful at the top of them at one point, but, and now they were gone. Um, and they're all kind of different. So if it was erosion, I'm not really sure how that worked. It was too perfect. Yeah. It's too perfect. They are very, the, the grooves are very straight. We're looking at the picture right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They're very strange. Yeah. So I think the tallest one, which is that one you're looking at is 22 feet high. Wow. Um, yeah. And I, I, there's not been much research. In fact, Marty's probably done more research than anybody else. Um, I don't know how deep they go into the ground. Well, what's the soil like? I mean, is it is it? It's farmland. Okay, so it's, it's deep soils, like. Huh. Yeah, it's clay, kind of clay-based soil. So it, um, they they have to be going down to the bedrock. Yeah, man. Or at least I, they I have to be know. pretty deep because I mean, you put it in clay. When the clay gets wet. It'll it expands sinking. and contracts yeah. when it dries and expands when it's wet and it's, I mean, it's going to move. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know what, yeah, I'm going to say, I don't know. Yeah. Kyle. And I wonder what's, you know, what did, is there, was there supposedly structures around them or is, what's the, what's the deal with that? Is it, um, so I've I know it's, eight. I know it's farmland, so probably a lot of it's been destroyed yeah. right, by people farming, but. Absolutely. So, um, there might have been seven stones, up to seven stones. There oh, okay. were definitely five. Um, and they, it looks like they might be aligned to the Pleiades. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of evidence for that. Again, Marty in the Discord. Um, so there's three left. And as you approach it, it's in a small village near a place called Borough Bridge in North Yorkshire. Um, so it's basically in someone's farm now. Yeah. In someone's farmland. Um, and it was, um, I guess, where they graze their sheep. So. Are the other the stones be- completely gone? Like they've been quarried away? They're gone. Wow. They, they were destroyed. You know, the devil. It's the devil's work, Russ. <laughs> you know, the satanic agency in Yorkshire is rife. <laughs> you know, we've got the witch trials. We've got. You know, Dracula, you know, was inspired here. You know, we've got it all here, you know, ghosts, goblins, everything. Yeah. Um, Somebody has a, a little outbuilding built of sandstone that you need to talk to. Oh, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, around Avebury, most of the pavement around there, you know, the cobbled pavement, that's all, you know, all the stones they they hacked up. What they would do is they dig a ditch next to the stone um, and they would build a giant fire in there and get the stone really hot and then dump it in water. Yeah. So it would all crack. Right. And then they would build with it, you know? Yeah. Anyway. So I think that's probably what happened, um, at the devil's arrows. Um, it has other names as well, but they're all, you know, evil place. Don't go there, you know? Oh. Um, you know, the, the, the early kind of medieval Christians, they were scared. I mean, they were scared of stuff like that. Um, and I think that's why, you know, we've lost so much of the information because, you know, there's so many wars and so many people were wiped out who had that knowledge. Um, you know, it, it's sad. So, um, so we get there and it's a beautiful day. And I notice there's a fence around this field. And so I was you know, swearing and cussing a bit. I was like, <laughs> effing farmers think they can, you know, keep me away from these megaliths and monoliths. And so I had a bit of a rant, but, um, but I wasn't really mad. Um, it was quite a low fence and it looked like super brand new. And this lady walking by with her dog, she went, oh, that's an electric fence. Oh. And I'm like, I'm, so I got even more mad. I'm like, yeah. how dare they <laughs> put an electric fence around these monoliths? This is a national heritage site. Um, so obviously we didn't touch the fence. And she's like, oh, no, it's not on. It's The fence isn't on. There's no sheep in there. They only turn it on when the, when the sheep are there. I was uh, like, oh. 
So I was like, okay, fair enough. So we climbed right over it. I touched it, climbed right over it, walked to the monolith. Um, and Chris is like, he's super spiritual. So like instantly we both take off our shoes. Cause I like to ground myself, took off our shoes. You know, we we're doing our own thing, you know, connecting in whatever way we, we could, how, however we felt comfortable. And so we were kind of just doing our own thing. And, um, my feet started to burn the wow. really hot, super hot. I mean, it was a warm day, but it wasn't like I wasn't in the desert or on the pavement. Yeah. Um, and I was like, wow, there's loads of energy coming into my feet. You know, I was like, wow, you know, um, so we were just enjoying, we were just enjoying the place and I wanted to hang out at the other stone and I'd brought some kind of things to charge up like some personal items of mine to like put near one of the stones and, you know, just yeah. charge up and, you know, be like a hippie. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, Google. so I went to, yeah, so I went to the smaller stone and that one was kind of at the edge of the farm, the edge of the field on the other side of the fence. So one of the stones was within the fence and I think two of the other stones were on the outside of the fence. So I climbed back over the fence and there was some grass around the smaller stone. So I put my, my beautiful items um, and I lost my mom this year and I put some of the things that were special to me that my mom had given me. I took off my shoes again because um, I, I put them back on because it was so hard to walk on the, on the land. It was like chunky and rocky and... And I sat down. Meanwhile, Chris had brought some dowsing rods and he went back to the car to get his dowsing rods. I'm like, go get him, go oh, get him. I'll be cool. Yeah. I'll be cool. So he comes walking back over towards me and these things are going, woo, woo, going back and forth like crazy. And he was trying to find some kind of, you know, pattern or like a line of energy. And he was just like, this place is insane. You know, there's no, there's no, it's not guiding me anywhere. So, of course, I was super excited and I got up and I'd found a stick and I have a thing about walking sticks. I like collecting sticks. So I got the stick and I slipped my shoes back on and I came over to him. So he was on the other side of the fence and I was on the opposite side of the fence. And I had the stick in my left hand and I had the, the fence to my left side Anyway, these dowsing rods were going crazy, and I was, like, all excited. I'm like, oh, my God, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go slowly here because this is where the crazy thing happens. So my stick was in the ground. It wasn't wet. There was no, it wasn't wet ground. I wasn't touching the fence. And all of a sudden, I'm screaming. So a current came up the stick, up my arm, up my left arm, down my side, my left side, into my chest cavity, I guess through my heart, um, up my neck and out of my right temple. And wow. it hurt a lot. Whoa. And so kind of as I was in pain and I'm freaking out, like I didn't know why I was freaking out. And then I was like... <laughs> Chris is like, did you touch the fence? I'm like, I didn't touch the fence. <laughs> and I'm effing the farmer so badly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I had it turned on the fence. But I was like, Chris, I'm like, Chris, I didn't touch the fence. <laughs> He's like, you must have touched the fence. I'm like, I didn't touch the fence. <laughs> so um so that was crazy. And people, people are like, you must have been electrocuted by the fence. But then people have said, Yeah, but a shepherd's fence. If you'd have touched a shepherd's fence, you'd have got a little tiny jolt. Yeah, yeah. That's for sheep, not humans. And I, so I was freaking out because I was like, oh, my God, if there had been a toddler here, they'd have been like zapped over the road. And Well, yeah, so usually was, they, they, just, they just give a little tick every second or two. Yeah. It's not a constant uh, charge either. Charge, right. So I, So I was convinced that... Yeah, and I, it's supposed I like, to be off, right? I mean, didn't it, they say you guys climbed over it? So I, we we touched it, we climbed over it. Yeah, so touching the fence doesn't make sense anyway because it was supposed to be off. 
But the, yeah, the first thing I thought of is the grounding rod. Somewhere along that electric fence, they had to drive in. Yeah, a grounding, grounding rod. Rods, yeah, um, and there's a wire that goes to it. I don't know if that wire would shock you. They're the same. You know, they're the Voltage. same potential as the ground. Right. Yeah. So that's yeah. So I don't know what happened at all. Yeah. Um, like literally, and people have tried to explain it away from me, and I'm like, yeah, well, I don't know. It was weird. Well, I know it was weird. You picked up a druid staff and paid for it. <laughs> that's what someone said. Someone's like, y you shouldn't be picking up staffs in places like that. You don't know what Satanists go down there. <laughs> No, seriously. What's, and then that scared me half to death. I was like, Satanist. oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. So luckily, uh, Chris made me do some breathing and a meditation. And I was like, do I have to go to the hospital? Do I, do I have to go to get checked out? He's like, no, 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 you're no. fine. You're fine. So I did a meditation and I was fine. That's Except crazy. for like the crazy story. Yeah. Man. I got to try that. Yeah. <laughs> Do it. Remind me Do to it. pick up a wizard's staff next time we're at an ancient site. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll try that out. All right. Let's take a break. Thank you so much. This is a lot of fun. We'll come back uh, in a little bit. Snacks. Ladies and gentlemen, Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, uh, where there are no degrees, only certificates of ignorance. Now we are joined by Shannon, and she is, uh, we're going through some of the, we're about to start going through some of the folklore uh, from the area she's at, and uh, yeah, I'm excited to hear this. So we heard a couple of her crazy, interesting stories about stuff that's happened to her when she's visited these sites. And now we, uh, we're going to talk about some of the folklore that's involved in this area. Is that right? Uh, yes, indeed. Okay. Um, there's a, quite an amazing story about the Devil's Arrow site. Um, and it's from a book um, called Yorkshire Legends and Traditions. And it's a facsimile of an 1888. So it's like a reprint series um, written by Thomas Parkinson, who's obviously now deceased. Um, and... Yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. So I'm I'm gonna read that if that's okay. Oh yeah, yeah. let's hear it. Yeah. Um, okay. One moment, please. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> <laughs> so the the chapter starts out with something quite interesting, um, and it's called "Legends of Satanic Agency." Oh. So, and I that obviously speaks to the fact that um, as you two have have both kind of pointed out um, when you look on a map of Yorkshire, most of these sites have the word devil in. Oh, yeah. They're attributed to the devil, to witchcraft, to evil, to Satan. Um, don't go near them, you know, um, you know, pagan, heathens, and all that. Um, and do people still feel that way? Like... In general, there or is, are they just like yeah, whatever, you know? Yeah, they're like yeah, whatever. Okay, good. This is yeah. this is cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, which is kind of good and kind of sad at the same time. You know, spiritual kind of journeys are waning quite a lot. Yeah, I just mean the um, evil part, right? Because yeah, it's, it's the same here. <laughs> yeah. Like we have, there's plenty of places in in the U.S. that has the devil in the name, and I. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that those names were given that way on purpose, yeah. you know, but now people are like, yeah, sure, I'll go hiking in Devil's Canyon. It's not like they're afraid of the devil there. So, yeah, I'm sure some people are. Um, it's possible. Yeah. It's yeah, possible. No, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so legends of satanic agency, legends attributing marvels in the physical world to the agency of the powers of evil are numerous in all lands, whatever seen beyond human power to accomplish or was 
inexplicable as its origins or purpose was in the Middle Ages, almost certain to be set down as work of the devil and as such in popular tradition has been handed down to our own times. And these stories frequently still hold their own against all that the teaching of science or the progress of discovery can say to the contrary. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Legends of this class are numerous in Yorkshire and elsewhere. Many of them have many characteristics in common, and often it is evidence that, evident that one relating to a particular place or object has been appropriated and applied to other places and objects of like character, and thus the story has been multiplied many times over. So a few of this class of legend will be related here. Um, and this one's the devil's arrows or the devil's bolts, which is where I allegedly got electrocuted. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure. Not sure. Uh, I, I do want to say, um, before I start reading it, there are going to be some words that, I don't really know how to pronounce them at all because they're, they're probably all consonants. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're um, either you know Celtic or you know ancient you know Old English or or Scandinavian you know Dana you know Old Danish you know whatever Vikings spoke. Don't ask me. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, no problem. You know what? I, uh, I think all these place names in Yorkshire. They are, when you look up etymology, no one knows. It's like, oh, it could be yeah, this, that's cool. could be that, could be the land of the boars, could be the land of the yew trees. No one's sure. Um, Man, so there are going to be, yeah, so I'm, you know, sorry. No um, problem. Yeah. Yeah, so. Just keeping with the tradition of us not knowing how to pronounce stuff on this show, right? <laughs> it's not a problem. Yeah, so just, you know, <laughs> hit me up later. <laughs> I can take it. Um, so near to Aldborough, the ancient Isur of the British and Isurium of the Roman times, um, and still nearer to the more modern town of Boroughbridge, stand three stone obelisks. And that word, Isur, I-S-E-U-R, I mean, it kind of looks French to me, but... It means, apparently it means Isis. And that river was called the River Isis near oh, the wow. Devil's Arrows. Wow. You know, in ancient, ancient times. So that I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah. So in this tale, it says there stand three stone obelisks. Formerly there were four, but I've read that there were five, seven. So you know what? No one knows. Which have which have in all historic times taxed the curiosity of observers and the ingenuity of inquirers to account for the manner in which they have come to be where they are and for their original object or purpose. They are massive stone pillars calculated to weigh from 30 to 36 tons each, standing upright in a line running north and south, the second at the distance of 66 yards from the first and the third at 120 yards from the second, each having about two yards of its base embedded in the earth. So there you go, Kyle. Uh, All right. Two yards. So what's that? Eight six, feet? Six, six feet. Six feet. Thank you. They are known as the devil's bolts or the devil's arrows, and legend thus explains their name and what learned men have yet been unable satisfactorily to do, their origin and original use also. Mm. So in the days when Azure was the capital of the Brigant Brigantine kingdom, that's the Celtic kingdom, the Celtic tribe, and the king of that powerful British tribe reigned in that city, there came thither a small band of first Christian missionaries who visited this country. Don't know what from, from where. Sorry. Ooh, sorry. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> Whack. They expounded before the king and his nobles their new doctrine and exhorted them to forsake their Druidic gods and become followers of Christ. The king appointed a conference at which he would preside of his chiefs, the Druids of his kingdom, and the missionaries. This was held near Rulestone Scar on the slope of the Hambleton Hills, obviously nearby. 
As the discussion was proceeding and the cause of the Christian teachers was winning its way, the assembly was joined by a strange druid of commanding and venerable appearance. At the king's request, the stranger took a place among them and listened to the further exposition of this new faith. He then arose and by jibe and taunt and sneer ridiculed the teachings of the strangers and upheld the tenets and advantages of Druidism so effectively that a murmur of applause ran through the assembly. When he sat down, the king arose and said, Venerable priest, thou speakest well, thy words are truth. These strangers must now leave our shores and return to the land whence they came, for we are unable to accept what they conceive, conceive to be truth. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> Fortunately, however, one of the missionaries had noticed as this venerable arch druid had raised his garment somewhat by the earnestness of his action while speaking, that his feet appeared to be sinking into the rock on which he stood, and that he har- and that the hard stone was partly liquefied around them. <laughs> what? <laughs> I know. <laughs> At once it was flashed upon the observer's mind who the opponent was with whom they had to deal. He there and then challenged him as a great arch fiend, the enemy of all righteousness, against whom they had been warning the assembly and cried in a stern voice, Satan, I defy thee in the name of him whom thou hast reviled. I command thee to show thyself who thou art and to depart to the hell whence thou camest. So, yeah, okay. Old English there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> At once he was unmasked and stood forth in all his hideousness in the sight of all present. Then amid sulfurous emanations and the ex- execrations of those who had so nearly been his dupes, he took his flight. But being unable to extricate his feet from the semi-molten rock on which he stood, he bore away with him a large mass of rock, adhering to them until in passing over Howe Hill, some six or seven miles to the west of the Isier, the mass became loosened and dropped to the ground. Sometime afterwards, he conceived the idea of turning to account his late burden as an instrument of the, for the annihilation of the now Christian city of Azure. He therefore re-winged his flight to Howe Hill, cut up the massive rock into four large bolts or arrows, and planting his feet firmly, one on the front and the other behind the hill, he addressed the doomed town in the words, which some more mundane being must have heard, for they have ever since been reported from mouth to mouth. Burrowbrig, Burrowbrig, keep out of the way, for Albra town all ding down today. And then he hurried, we are not told whether with his hands after the manner of hurling a javelin or as bolts from a gigantic crossbow or as arrows from a long bow, but somehow he hurled the ponderous stones at the town. They were all, however, by some means intercepted when far short of their goal and fell each in the place it is since occupied." One end firmly embedding itself in the earth and keeping the rest in an upright and nearly up in an or nearly upright position, memorials for all time of the impotence of Satan's wrath and of his intended evil averted from this faithful city. The end. <laughs> wow. I know, right? So the devil's arrows. Okay. Yeah. I he know, fleed I... from the priests and then the rocks that stuck to him, he threw like arrows back at their, that's wild. Yeah, well, he, yeah, he has to come back. And split them up, and then he throws okay. them. He throws them at the town, and it doesn't work. So, yeah, they're, so, so they're being... associating the druidism with with Satanism there, yeah, directly, yeah, yeah. Wow. No, I'm. I mean, it's classic, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it is. It is. You know, look away, people. Look over here. Um, no, but I. Well, I think what fascinated me the most was him liqu- his feet liquefying into the yeah yeah own. Because I was yep, like, big mistake yeah. there, Satan. You know, well, you're trying to trying to hide as a druid, and you don't you don't notice that your feet are sinking into the stone. <laughs> no, crazy, right? But I was thinking of Shamir too. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking too that it's like this is, uh, you know, they arrive there and find some people that have some way of working stone. 
Yeah, yeah. Exactly. That appears to be like devil's magic. Yeah. Oh, hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, so I thought that was that was fascinating. Um, so yeah, they were they were thrown down and and I, I know there's other there's other tales of how devil's arrows came to be as well. Um, but yeah, most accounts are that they were you know used as pagan pagan ritual sites and you know people danced you know crazy around fires and. Um, but that again sounds to me like um, those pagan dancers found these yeah. sites already in place and venerated them. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's kind of the same thing we talk about with Egypt and some of these other places that, uh, you know, okay, let's, let's, let's drag all these gigantic stones hundreds of miles and stand them up in a circle so we can dance. <laughs> no, that's not, that's not what happened. <laughs> I know. Well, I, I know, um, I know there's a lot of work that's gone on and, and due to the astronomical alignments of these, these sites and specifically in Yorkshire, they correlate to before you know, the younger Dryas, you know. Oh, wow. Well, the, the, the alignments do. Like if you reverse the clock, this they line up with. Uh, yeah, they wow. they correlate to, you know, a lot longer than 11,000 years ago, I think, or around there. Um, again, don't ask me because I don't know. But I've definitely read things in the Discord to that effect. Um, is it the Stellar Stellarium? Yes. Yep. Yeah, I think people are using the Stellarium. Um and definite alignments to Orion, the Pallades, you know, other places. Um, in in you know, and again, maybe so that a reminder for people, you know, look what happened. Um, look what happened to our ancestors. You know, just just keep it in mind, something to pass on. But obviously, that's all lost now. Um, and again. Um, People in Yorkshire didn't start to read and write for thousands of years after that. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the tales, again, they're they're watered down, and um, you know it, it is it is sad. Um, yeah. So that's the Devil's Arrows. Um, that's really cool. Yeah. And so it's near a yeah. river called the River Isis. It was called the River Isis, the Azure. I mean, there's there's Roman names, Celtic names for it. Yeah. Um, it is it is actually in the same book that he explains it, and I think that's um, in the part that talks about the origins of York, the city, the great city of so, York. So it could have been the Romans that named it that. I mean, we don't have to dig into that. Yeah. No, no, that. no. I, I no. I think. Um, it, because that area was the capital of the Celtic tribes first uh -huh. before the Romans. So, um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's all, it's all fascinating. Um, so going back to kind of the giants, um, I've got, um, I've got a story about how the landscape of Yorkshire was actually formed. Um, and again, you know, attributed to the giants and their, just they're messing around, really. Yeah, um, that's cool. Let's hear it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is about one of our famous giants called Wade. And apparently he was often referenced by, by other authors, um, which kind of lends to us thinking now that even though we don't have any written documentation of the stories specifically to Wade, um, people like Chaucer would reference Wade like kind of as a given that people knew what he was talking about. Mm. Um, and that kind of comes up quite a lot with a lot of these giants. Um, and there's, I mean, there's several famous giants attributed to different places around Yorkshire. Um, so this is Wade. So stories of Wade the giant can be found all over North Yorkshire. He's said to have traveled right across Yorkshire with his wife, Belle, building roads and castles as he went, 
some of which you can still visit today. The castle ruins hidden in Mulgrave Woods near Whitby and Pickering Castle are credited to Wade and Bell's building skills. The two are said to have built the castles at the same time, but they only had one hammer. Luckily, they were happy to share and flung it to each other across the moors. <laughs> so you can imagine they just flung this hammer like hundreds of miles to each other, shouting and bellowing. Um, it's just hilarious. Wow. I know. <laughs> it's crazy. If you've ever driven towards the coast through the North Yorkshire moors, it's likely you've seen the whole of Horkham. It's an incredible sight, especially when the heather is in full bloom. And the, then the 400 meter deep, half mile wide crater is a favorite for walkers. So uh, the whole of Horkham, um, another epic site in Yorkshire, 400 meters, no idea. I mean, I do, but I can't do math. So I'm not gonna do <laughs> well, um, what is it? It's a crater. Is that what they're saying? Yeah. Half mile wide crater. It's like just like a giant kind of valley but i mean who knows and i've looked into crater sites in yorkshire and i can't find anything definitive you know that actually says yeah a meteorite yeah landed here yeah i can't find anything it's 1300 um, feet deep or across that's, Is that no right? that's 400 meters 400 meters deep a half a mile wide yeah wow <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's yeah yeah so also known as the Don't devil's punch bowl so again, the devil, you know, work of the devil. Yep. Um, the whole of Horkham is said to have been created when Wade, during a fight with Belle, grabbed a handful of earth to throw at her. So yeah, I mean, right there, probably comet debris and meteorites, um, you know, retold into stories, you know, to scare children, basically, I guess. I don't know. Um, That's cool. Yeah. Grabbed a handful of dirt to throw at her. We're sure you'll be pleased to know that he missed. The mound of earth sailed past Bell and landed to form the outcropping at Blakely Topping. So Wade and Bell made their home in the moors and created lots of, created lots of roads to make their journeys easier. You can still travel along Wade's Causeway in Weedale Moor. The causeway covers around 25 miles from Malton to Eskdale and is believed to be about 6,000 years old. So oh, hmm. crazy. You can find the grave markers for for the mighty Wade if you care to look. A six foot standing stone appropriately named Wade Stone marks the head of the giant's grave. Twenty yards away, you'll find another marker, also called Wade Stone, which marks the foot of the grave. Uh -huh. So let's go digging there. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I know there's um, a town in North Yorkshire. Um, that's near, you know, the Victoria Caves that Velikovsky talks about, you know, with the blended animals. Yeah, yeah, that's in Yorkshire, and I'm I've yet to go there. In fact, the museum is, I think, is not even going to reopen until next spring because of you know things that are going on. Yeah. Um, and I don't actually think you can go in those caves anymore, but they've basically created a museum. Um, all about it. So, so I will try and, and get there. All right. Awesome. Um, yeah. So was that, was that earth and upheaval? All yes. the Yorkshire yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's, I looked up this, let's see what Wikipedia says about it. Uh, whole of Horkham, a section of the Valley of, uh, Levisham Beck. And it says, uh, it was created by a process called spring sapping where water welling up from the hillsides gradually undermines the slopes above, eating the rocks uh -huh. away grain by grain. In this way, over thousands of years, a once <laughs> narrow valley widened and deepened into an enormous cauldron that it's definitely not a meteor hole. So, Darn it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's all uh, Wikipedia giving us a standard model right yeah. there. Yeah. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah. Sounds like the... Uh... Was it the uh, yeah the uh, lacustrine yeah uh, the Aeolian lacustrine something <laughs> something yeah I'm trying to think oh. of what the spring name is uh, artesian artesian yeah. lacustrine something or other yeah it's, for it's the Carolina general. bays yeah right oh right okay yeah. okay yeah the complex darn it. theory right darn it darn it yeah I mean the landscape here is just 
I mean, there could be craters all over the place, but you know, it's just too difficult to yeah. say, I guess. And no one's looking, you know, I, I don't think people are looking. Um, I don't, I don't know. Um, but yeah, um, fascinating landscape around there on um, the Yorkshire Moors, <laughs> countless myths and legends about that place, you know, the werewolves and the hounds from hell and, um, you know, uh, what's his name? Darn it. Bram Stoker. Bram Stoker, who wrote Dracula. Yeah. You know, used the landscape up here as a backdrop for that book. Uh-huh. Um, you know, derelict abbeys. And, you know, most of those things now, the medieval buildings, they are derelict and in ruins, but they still are protected. Um, you know, countless abbeys and castles and just ruins. Um, and Whitby, which is a coastal town here, um, it's like famous for their goth weekends and their music festivals, you know, and kids are all dressed in black and, you know, cause of Dracula. So it's, uh. it's huge. It's like a huge kind of cultural thing going on in Whitby, um, because of Bram Stoker. Um, but yeah, the Moors, I, you wouldn't get me up there. You couldn't pay me. So Russ, you can go. <laughs> Um, what's the deal is just a just a wasteland or i wouldn't call it a wasteland it's like it's like maybe scrubland but it's like limestone and it's heather you know not trees don't grow there Mm -hmm. you know it's scary and spooky and you know it's always foggy you know you Uh, can see it i remember i remember the moors from the hound of the baskervilles yeah right yeah and and it's like you get lost just trying to cross this landscape yeah. I'm like, how does, I don't understand the landscape here. I guess I need to, to yeah, look it up. Yeah. It's like rocky and kind of, kind of barren and bleak, but I mean, it's beautiful, but it's bleak. I mean, it's not somewhere I would choose to go. I prefer more lush valley kind of scenes, but. Um, you want to disappear not, in the woods, not out on the rocky yeah. terrain. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> Yeah, because at least there's berries in the woods. <laughs> you know, you, you can you so can eat. So, what are the two castles that were mentioned in that story? The ones that they were supposed to be building at the same time. Um, I think Musgrave and Pickering. How? how oh, dang it, Russ. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, I, have, I don't mean the names. I mean, like, are they ruins? Are they? Oh yeah. Okay. Um, I think Castle, I think Castle Howard is still intact. I mean, you can visit them all. I mean, there's one in the city I live in. It's awesome. You know, it's ruins, but it's brilliant. There was a huge battle there. Mm. Um, and it's like the, I don't know, 1400s or something. Totally probably got that wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sugar. No problem. Long uh, time ago. Yeah, it was so long ago. Um, yeah. Uh, pick. I think it was Pickering yeah, Pickering Castle and Musgrave Castle. So they're they're up there in ruins. There's a few that are intact here. I mean, I'm not really. So do you know? Is there a reason why they're saying that those were built by giants? Is there like is it is there something specific? Like it has megalithic foundations or something, or is it just that's just part of the story? I, I think. I mean, I did think about that today when I was rereading some of the things I've written down, and I was just like, yeah. I mean. What's that about? I don't. Yeah. I don't know. Like why those two in particular? I have no idea. Mm. I'll maybe s- someone will know, or I'll, I can try to find out. I don't know. I mean, they were a lot of those castles were built. You know, like a lot of kind of things that we find around the globe. You know, the Romans might have built a fort or something, and then they were kind of repurposed and rebuilt on top of and right. on top of again. Um, so yeah, who knows? I mean, maybe they were Celtic forts and strongholds or whatever. I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah, that's it is interesting because you know we see the the, the place has been occupied for forever. So you know, the reusing right. of sites over and over is, you know, it's going to happen. Like like what we talk about with Egypt, you know, with Ben, where mm-hmm. he's like, look, that you know, these are they, they they find these things and then they build on top of them. This happens in Peru too, probably. Sure. And so it's, I just was, I'm just wondering if they the le- found megalithic foundations there and that's yeah. what they built on top right. of. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. What I was thinking too. I'm, you're probably right. And there's probably giant skeletons there too. <laughs> so is the Giants um, Causeway there in Yorkshire? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the. Yeah. <laughs> 
I first <laughs> learned I first learned about that on the cover of a Led Zeppelin album. Man. Oh right. Yeah. Okay. I was like, what is this place? It's real. Oh my god, it's real. Yeah, I did I had no context for understanding that, but yeah, it's the it's the basalt the columnar basalt coming out of yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so 6,000 years ago, it was like thick forest here, like Stone Age hunter-gatherers were here 6,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, it's yeah, it's crazy. I don't, I don't know. So there is a process for that, you're saying? Yes, the it's, columnar basalt is, right. you know, is formed when the, when, uh, you know, it's basically lava flows. Right, okay. It crystallize okay. into the, into the... Basalt columns. Crazy. And they have that hexagonal uh, form or whatever. But I just, it's a right. cool, you know, it's a really cool spot just coming out of the ocean. It's, you know, the name, Giant's Causeway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, is, is where? Uh, I thought that was in Scotland. I thought that, that's in Maybe Ireland, just, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I don't know Ireland, where it is. Yeah. I just. <laughs> no, this one is. Um, oh, you guys have uh, one too. Yeah, well, she, no. because in the story, you, there was a causeway that they made through the moors. Yeah, that's way. It's Wade's Causeway. Wade's here. Causeway, but is yeah, that one? Sorry. So that's <laughs> what I was Giants comparing causeway. it to the the Giants right. Causeway. But that's right, a natural. Okay. That's a, like a pretty well understood natural formation. So I'm wondering about the causeway that's in the story. Oh, that yeah. that was built six apparently six thousand years okay, ago. Twenty five mile road. Yeah, I get you. Okay. So wow. It's a yeah, built yeah. Road. Okay. Yeah, by hunter gatherers. Right. Yeah, that is makes. Sense. Yeah, because you need a road, you know, to hunt, hunt and gather. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Gosh. Yeah. So yeah. The, so the Giants Causeway you're talking about is is the Columbia Basalt, and that's yes, that's in Ireland, I guess. Yeah, I yeah. didn't know where it was. I just yeah. That that's yeah. just another you know, giant. Yeah. Lady. No. Yeah. It, the, yeah, and uh, I mean, there's. There's endless, there's endless places with giant in the name or named after a giant. I mean, <laughs> you can't escape it here. Yeah. Um, but what I was going to say about Thirsk, up near where the Velikovsky cave is, um, there is a museum there that has a giant skeleton still. Wow. Apparently. Whoa. And I think Hugh Newman... Hugh Newman went up there and, you know, it was like cheesy grin. He's like, oh, my God, <laughs> a real giant. But I think it was only like, you know, uh, just under eight feet. So not like mega right. huge. Yeah. Like the one that killed me that time. But um, no, apparent. And I'd, so I'd love to go there, too. Um, so there cool is a. See it, just, yeah. 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 No, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't that would be amazing to see one, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah. You know where they're describing you could put your fist through their eye socket. Holy type crap. Skulls. <laughs> I mean, uh, yes, please. Yeah. So another little thing that I think about often, and I can't really find a concrete answer for, is when I moved here, so I was 16. So I don't have red hair, but I grew up in California with people with red hair, obviously. Um, you know, and I guess we think of, you know, Celts, um, you know, for the origins of red hair. But when I moved here, I noticed that there was a lot of bullying towards ginners. They're called ginners here. Mm. Um, I'm like, you mean red, someone with red hair? And they're like, yeah, you know, he's got red hair. <laughs> ginger they have a ginger yeah. i'm like what what is the deal with the, the people with red hair i mean i never even heard of that ever so people had no answer for me and as i grew up you know it continued and it's in jest you know it's in jest yeah. but i'd be like you know that's why is that a thing and as i started reading more and more about giants um, you know, all these accounts of the, the horrible cannibalistic redheaded giants. Yeah. And so I always wondered if that's why people are just like have this, you know, kind of crazy, right. <laughs> not hate, hatred, but like kind of they're repelled almost. Um, 
by that. I don't know. It was always a weird thing when I moved to Yorkshire. It's like, yeah. So I don't know where that comes from. Hmm. It's just embedded, isn't it? It's yeah. the terrifying the giants and red hair. Yeah. <laughs> Must be weird. Yeah. So again, <laughs> giants are real. Yep. Especially the redheaded ones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, yep. So the redheads are the spawn of giants. There we go. <laughs> Mystery solved. Yeah. The ginger giants. <laughs> ginger. Yeah. And where does the ginger come from? I don't know. Ginger's yeah. brown. <laughs> I'm ginger. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. And then the other one was the long heads. So I have quite a substantial forehead. And that was the other thing. I wasn't bullied. People were like, oh, my God, you have such a big forehead. That, that never happened when I grew up in California. No one ever, like, pointed it out to me or went, oh, my God, you have a slap head. So they would call me a slap head because <laughs> I had a big forehead. And so I, re- I renamed my own forehead a five head because it wasn't a four. Yeah, it was yeah, a five. A five. That's right. Yeah, yep. a five head. Um, so, again, I would say what? is your problem with people who have high foreheads. And, you know, and obviously, you know, I actually found out that it was revered. You know, people deliberately shaved their foreheads so they would have a higher hairline. Yeah. But then, you know, and then looking into the long heads, you know, with you two, I'm just like. Yeah, you're supposed to be ruling over those people. That's why they would talk about it. Right. Right. You're supposed so to be running the place. Me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they were just jealous. That's they were right. just jealous of my big forehead. That's right. <laughs> but isn't it strange? It's so strange. Yeah. It These is These little quirky things. Yeah. Like that this last in a culture or a people for so long. This is weird. Yeah. It's so weird. But you guys have helped me kind of like make all these connections. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah. That's why. Long head confirmed. There we go. Yeah, I know, I know. All right, so, well, we gotta, yeah. let me take another yeah. break. Okay. We're already up on time. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Time flies in the cube. That's right. I know, right? We'll be right back. Okay. back ladies and gentlemen final segment of the final hour and uh yeah time flies it does so um wish which is actually what i know you by mostly yeah because the discord but um yeah what are we getting into next okay um so other legends around Yorkshire that are very, very prominent are ones about dragons and serpentine monsters. Ah, right. yes. And you find a lot of, um, in old churchyards, you find lots of dragons and water serpents and snakes. And and you can never really find much information on, which is a bit sad. In fact, a lot of them are attributed to the just the Anglican people. And it's like, is that all you've got? I don't know. Um, so it's it's quite a shame because there's some beautiful, absolutely like fountains and, you know, you're just like walking along and there's like huge dragons everywhere. You know, it's it's fascinating. Wow, and cool. it's it, it is. And I know that, you know, there's kind of a good and evil to the serpent symbology. Mm-hmm. Um, absolutely. Um, and yet, you know, they continue to use it. And you know, whether it was to ward off evil or it was just kind of a nod to, you know, the pagan kind of culture that we used to have here. Um, you know, I don't know. It's it's hard to tell. So there is a lot of lore about dragons. Um, and, you know, I do find that they're, they're mostly the kind of classic ones where, you know, we need to, we need to, you know, smote all dragons. Um which is a shame, you know, it's always about, you know, eradicating. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's quite disappointing in that way. But they are they are great yarns. Um, so I'm just going to read again from this 1888 um, folklore book that I've got. 
Um, and this one is Legends of Dragons and Other Serpentine Monsters. All right. So serpent worship was one of the earliest and most prevalent superstitions of the heathen world. And even where it has long ceased, relics of it survive in popular superstitions and legends. Such are prevalent in almost all countries, yet in most of the stories, there is a great family likeness. The serpent, whether the ordinary one or the winged dragon or the wyvern or the worm. So in a lot of old English, you'll see dragons being called worms, which yep. is kind of weird. Mm-hmm. Um, you probably know that. Um, worm with a Y. Yeah. 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 Um, is almost always represented it rep, rep, uh, represented as the terror and devastator of the country around which it dwells and is either proprieted or by offerings or slain by some champion knight who services as a deliverer or the benefactor of the neighborhood are perpetually perpetuated by monumental stone or celebrated in local song or both. So that's kind of a nod to, you know, all the monuments that are Oh, yeah. kind of left you know you see giant kind of statues here you know where saint george is slaying the dragon um you know and i've read a lot of literature you know that speaks to the ley line systems here in the british isles um and conquering that you know stamping that out and you know and the i mean the beautiful churches here are phenomenal but you know most of them are built on the ley lines yeah. Um, hmm. And all that serpentine ley line connection is fascinating as well. Um, so you're thinking that or you're, you're suggesting that possibly the um, the stories of destroying the dragon is about stomping out this more ancient belief system. Yeah. And the energies that they used to use mm. that I believe they used to use. Yeah. I mean, you know, you've talked endlessly about, you know, the 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 resonating stones and the vibrations and how they might have used that to create energy or. Yep. You know, healing. You know, I think it was for healing. You know, these ley lines. Except you know, for people, when they electrocute you, right? Well, right? <laughs> what the hell? I mean, I'm still like, and no one kind of believes me. <laughs> this is annoying. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, you really threw me there. I was like, I just went back to that place. I'm like, oh, my God. Um, so I, I think it was about healing and tapping into the, the energy of the land. Um, and I know, <laughs> you know, Kyle, you do that thing where, you know, it was all beautiful and, <laughs> and, and everyone was, you know, happy and, you know, no one fought and, but I, I mean, I kind of want to go there sometimes <laughs> that, you know, they, I think they were more connected to the earth <laughs> and Gaia, um, you know, and I think they lived more in harmony with her. Absolutely. Um, so who knows? There's so much. I mean, there's just so much. But the art here, you know, the the dragon and the serpentine art is phenomenal. You know, and the Gothic, the Gothic churches and the medieval churches. I mean, every it's still there. Um, so, so there's quite a lot of stories in this section, um, but I think I'm going to read an epic poem. Um, because it's the most exciting All right. thing. Um, but there's, there's countless, I mean, there must be like 10, you know, stories about, uh, local dragons around the area I live in. Um, you know, where, and the only positive one I ever heard was a, about a, a dragon that lived on Castle Hill and it's this huge, huge hill. It used to be a fort because you could just see for hundreds of miles all around and apparently there was a female dragon there who um, looked after this golden egg. And I know that a golden egg kind of transfers into other fairy tales. Mm-hmm. Yep. Isn't there one in like, is it Jack and the Beanstalk? Yep. Um, and she protected this egg. Yet in the story, it doesn't say what the egg was or, I mean, it's mm. obviously symbolic of something. Um I don't know, but that's a, that's an epic place as well. Um, brilliant. So there's a there's a quite a I wonder if it's poem. like an alchemical symbol for Could maybe the, the elixir of life or something like that. Oh yeah, yeah. You see the the egg in a lot of alchemical illustration, don't you? Yeah, I don't know. 
Who knows? You know, there's so a lot of these stories are so vague. You know, I've been reading them over the past few weeks. And I mean, most of them are pretty, they're pretty boring. You know, <laughs> you're like, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, they killed a dragon. OK. Um, <laughs> I, I was quite I was quite disappointed, really. But obviously, when they were told orally, I mean, they must have been like crazy good. You know, it must have been really, really good. Um, oh, it's, oh, God. Yeah, I mean, this could go on and on, like any episode of Brothers of the Serpent. Because um, <laughs> there's some creepy fairy stories. But, you, you know, we've kind of heard them all before, you know, like we were saying. They're all just, you know, kind yeah, of the same similar. story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So this poem, it's actually a stanza. And it's supposed to be humorous and satirical. And it's a description of a, a legal contest um, that happened, you know, between this guy from this hall and the other guy from another hall over the way. And um, But it's using um, the dragon as metaphor and as a description. So it's quite entertaining, hopefully. All right. Let's hear it. Okay. Old stories tell how Hercules, a dragon, slew at Lerna with seven heads and fourteen eyes to see and well discern her. But he had a club, this dragon, to drub, or he had never. I'm going to say never because they don't say a V, but right. I'm going to I'm going to correct it. <laughs> or he had never done it. I warrant ye. But more of more hall with nothing at all, he slew the dragon at Wantley, which is a real place. Then follows a description of the monster itself. This dragon had two furious wings, each one upon each shoulder, with a sting in his tail as long as a flail, which made him bolder and bolder. He had long claws and in his jaws four and forty teeth of iron with a hide as tough as any buff, which did him round in Byron. And then we have next the account of his ravages throughout the whole neighborhood. In one case, it said, devoured he poor children three that could not with him grapple. And at one sup, which means to eat, he ate them up and pff, shut up, Shannon, <laughs> as one would eat an apple. This is supposed to allude to the exploitation of the property of the three co-heiresses of Mr. Bosville, one of Sir F. Wortley's opponents. All sorts of cattle this dragon did eat. Some say he ate up trees, and that the forest sure he would devour up by degrees. For houses and churches were to him geese and turkeys. He ate all and left none behind. But some stones, dear Jack, that he could not crack which on the hills you will find. The reference to some stones is to Mr. Light. So it's all based around these real people. It's fascinating. The dragon's residence was in Yorkshire, near Fair Rotherham, the place I know it well, some two or three miles or thereabouts, I vow I cannot tell. But there is a hedge just on the hill edge, and Matthew's house hard by it. Oh, there, and then was this dragon's den. You could not choose by, but spy it. Hard by ferocious night there dwelt, of whom all towns did ring. These children, as I told, being eat, men, women, girls, and boys, sighing and sobbing, come to his lodging and make a hideous noise. Oh, save us all, more of more hall, thou peerless knight of these woods, do but slay this dragon who won't leave us a rag on. We'll give thee all our goods. Tut, tut, quoth he. No goods I want, but I want, I want in sooth. A fair maid of sixteen that's brisk and keen with smiles about the mouth. Hair black as a slow, skin white as snow with blushes or cheeks adorning. To anoint me overnight ere I go to fight and to dress me in the morning. The knight next proceeded to Sheffield Town and provided himself with a requisite armor, bristling with spikes in every part. Equipped in this, he was the admiration of and the wonder to all the neighborhood who came forth to see him. Moreover, 
He fried it all, cats, dogs, and all, each cow, each horse, and each hog, for fear they did flee, for they took him to be some strange outlandish hedgehog. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> His first step against the monster was not a very knightly one. He hid himself in a well to which the dragon was expected to come and drink. It is not strength that always wins, for wit doth strength excel, which make our cunning champion creep down into a well. Thence he was able, covertly, covertly to deal the monster a blow on the mouth, which made him cry, Boo! <laughs> the knight was, however, compelled to come forth from his ambush and stand up a fair fight. The contest is then described. Your words, quoth the dragon, I don't understand. Then to it they fell at all, like two wild boars so fierce, if I may, compare great things with small. Two days and a night with this dragon did fight, our champion on the ground. Though their strength, it is great. Their skill, it was neat. They never had one wound. That didn't rhyme at the end. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it just, at length, it however, just looks like it should rhyme, right? Ground and wound. Yeah, oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> I'm visual. like that. Wa- wound. They never had one wound. <laughs> yeah, that threw me. At length, however, the dragon gave the champion a blow which made him to reel. But this he returned with a kick, with a spiked toe of his boot, which put an end to the fight and the monster's life. Murder, murder, the dragon cried. Alack, alack for grief. Had you but missed that place you could have done me no mischief. Then his head he shaked, trembled and quaked, and down he laid and cried. First on one knee, then on back tumbled he, so groaned and kicked and died. The end. (laughs) Yeah, so I definitely, you know, not happy about all these slaying the dragons. Slaying of the dragons. So you said that that was a that were they were talking about real people. I I think it was supposed to be metaphor, but um, it's really long winded. Um, it's just pol- it's just pol- you know politics between families and, uh, and things like that um, and they've obviously turned it into a yarn you know um, so yeah but yeah it is interesting wanna- because the <clears throat> you know I, I picked up on the seven heads and 14 yeah. eyes that's you know it's like seven people yeah no good one yeah 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 it's, I think it's just family feud right. You know, interesting that they turned it into the the dragon and the knight. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's kind of yeah. It's it's interesting because it's kind of it kind of reminds me of when you know we were going to the epic of Gilgamesh where we're saying is this one person actually supposed to represent a bunch of people? Right. You know. So that so you have that you end up with this story where there's this fight between two characters. One of them's monstrous, and the other one is you know like a hero. But it's actually talking about two civilizations or two families or two groups or two tribes, whatever. Yeah, yeah, and they've, no. and they've characterized, you know, the the uh, the the two warring factions as one person each or one yeah. being, one entity. Yeah. So I wonder no. how I wonder how prevalent that kind of thing is throughout sort of oral traditions. Yeah, I don't know. I really don't. I mean, yeah, awesome points. I hadn't even thought about that with the the seven heads. Especially when you're teaching it to children. You know, it's easier to remember the hero and the dragon as opposed to like, well, you know, the Duke of blah, blah, blah with <laughs> such and such and his yeah third cousin. Yeah. <laughs> Twice removed. Twice removed. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm. I mean, I, they all have a message, don't they? And and what's lost and what I I think you know I know I keep talking about that, but it, it really bothers me that we've lost so much. It really, really gets to me. Um, you know, I mean that. I mean, you're probably right, Russ. That probably is. You know, just yeah, and so know, about it's, the two feuding families, right? And so what's the what have, what have we lost? It's the it's the decoding of the story, right? Because the stories survive. Um, 
<laughs> yeah. So what yeah. Do, maybe what doesn't survive in a lot of cases is the unwritten knowledge that is supposed to be disseminated by the storyteller after telling the story. Right. I think this yeah. is I think this is the case with all kinds of ancient texts. It's that's is what it feels like, you know, the more we dig into them, the more it seems like okay, this is the exoteric part of the teaching. And it's filled with esoteric symbols in which a yeah. lot and in some cases a lot of the the meanings have been lost or they're yeah. still or maybe they're not lost, they're just still esoteric and you have to It's kind of like yeah. a mnemonic, right? Where it's it you take you take characters out of each word and you make this this thing that you can remember right, because yeah. the, all of the numerous words are hard to remember. But if you can shorten it to this quick and easy thing, then you can then once yeah, you have that in your head, you can then make the associations with all the actual words and remember the entire phrase. Sure. Which teaches sure. you something. So it's like these stories are doing that same like thing to like a more yeah for hi, for a historical event yeah mm. yeah they're like con condensing it and putting a visual kind of aspect to it as well yeah so at the time if it was let, let's say at the time it was being taught you're also being taught all of the details but this is the story that helps you remember all those details yeah right yeah and i you're absolutely right and i but i also think that a lot of it just wasn't written down you know, by the time Which it kind a, of got diluted and diluted and the stories are written down, I'm like, is that it? That doesn't even make sense. You know, you read things and I'm like, well, what happened to that guy? Or, um, But no, absolutely. And again, people didn't start writing things down in Yorkshire for sure. For, you know, it wasn't very long ago they started writing things down at all. Yeah. And that's um, definitely what you would do in a in a situation where you didn't write anything down, is you would create condensed yeah. versions that were easy to remember and transmit. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I mean there's there's quite a few stories. They're all, you know, a little bit similar, but you know, they're they're fascinating because I I mean personally I love because they're based around this landscape and they're, you know, places I know. Um so I can read, I can read something else. Yeah, for let's sure. hear it for sure. Yeah. yeah. So this is the serpent of Slingsby. So this is going to be a tongue twister maybe. <laughs> um, and this is um, in the north of Yorkshire, Slingsby. It's like a, an actual place. So Slingsby, a small parish town in the north riding of Yorkshire is distinguished mm -hmm. for three things. The ruins of a castle a maypole, and the tradition of an enormous serpent. The castle is comparatively modern, but nonetheless a splendid ruin. The maypole, one among the dozen yet remaining in Yorkshire, remind us of a time forever passed away. Our business is with the serpent alone. The road through Slingsby from Hovingham to Malton instead of proceeding in a direct line to which there is no natural obstacle made until lately altered a singular and awkward bend to the right. This deviation was observed by Roger Dodsworth, the antiquary, and in reply to his inquiries, he received the following story. The tradition is that between Malton and this town, there was some time a serpent that lived upon prey of passengers and which this wyvil and his dog did kill when he received his death wound. There is a great hole half a mile from the town, round within, three yards broad and more, where the serpent lay, in which time the street was turned a mile on the south side, which does still show itself if any takes pains to survey it. This tradition, written down in 1619 by one of the most painstaking of antiquaries, is current among the villagers to this day, who yet point out the place where the serpent had its den, declaring that the said serpent was a mile in length, and in support of the story, point to the effigies of Wyville and his dog, yet remaining in their church. Both Wyville and his dog perished in the fight or died soon afterwards, and were commemorated by this monument. Dodsworth saw it and says, when speaking of Slingsby Church, 
There is in the choir a monument cross-legged, cross-legged of one of the Wyvilles at his feet, a Talbert coursing. Hmm. Yeah, I really need to watch it for that. So I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> is um, that and there's a Talbert coursing. All right, Kyle, will look it up. Look it up. Yeah. <laughs> Talbot, I know it. I know that often, there's often pubs called Talbot, I think. Well, keep I going. I'll, I'll see if I yeah, can find yeah. it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> also, a lot of the churches, I like going into churches. I love going into churches. Um, (laughs) Sadly, a lot of them aren't open anymore. Like you used to be able to just walk into the churches here, like, you know, any day, any time. And sadly, you know, you have to book in now. And um, I know it's sad. Make an appointment. That's what you mean. Yeah, the the Talbot (laughs) was a type of hunting hound common in England during the Middle Ages. Ah, right. Thank you. So it was the guy and his dog. Yeah. Yeah. So coursing probably means it was running. Or right. something. Oh, like that. Okay. So his it showed his dog running at or his something feet, at yeah. his feet or something like that or coursing. <laughs> yeah, that's probably a different term there. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Mystery solved. <laughs> Next mystery. mystery solved. Thank you, Kyle. Yeah. So in a lot of these churches, there'll be the um, you know the stone. I'm getting really tired. You can probably tell now. It's late here in England. Um, <laughs> I'm like going real slow now. Um, oh, what are they called? Not mausoleums. When you get a big stone, you know, uh, like altar? coffin. Oh, uh, uh, no, sarcophagus. No, it, a sarcophagus. Duh, duh. Yeah. Uh, you get a lot of those. And, you know, there's often the knights, you know, with the dragons wrapped around them, mm. you know, in the churches here. I mean, it's it's just over and over again. It's just strange. Wow. Yeah, it's very strange. Um, so, was that the end of that? That was tale? yeah. That that was the end. You see what I mean? It's like oh, okay. Well, I got you. What, I was like, wait, what? where's the rest of the story? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that. So, so but right. the point is, is that they, they changed the route of the road and made it wind around to go a mile away from this hole where the serpent lived. That's the whole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically. That actually, yeah, when you said That's that, cool. that remind, I that pinged a memory. I think I've heard of this before. Um, I don't know if it's that specific road, but I remember I have this vague memory of that where the road could be straight, but it goes, it makes this unexplained bend. Right, right. Yeah. And people are like, why is this, why does this road make this long bend? And it's, it's this old legend of this, of this serpent there. Sure. And yeah. I think that that still happens today where there are sacred sites that aren't necessarily protected by, you know, national heritage. Yeah. But, you know, the, the lore around that place or that, that stone or that tree or that little hill is is so important to the locals that you know they you do see roads just going round things randomly here. Yeah. Um, you know That's we don't cool. really have many straight roads here because it was, you know, a lot of Yorkshire was built, you know, in rebellion to the Romans occupy you know occupying. Um, they didn't build straight roads whereas the Romans did. So all the straight roads are Roman, mm. and the rest of them were to fool the Romans. Ah. Yeah. Um, Romans can't understand curved roads. <laughs> I'll keep no, this in it, mind. It fools them. <laughs> yeah. Their, their chariots don't go along curved roads. <laughs> yeah. And they don't understand because all roads must lead to Rome. So how right, can this I, road be curving away from Rome? I don't know. <laughs> I don't. I don't. No, I mean, when we still have, um, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, you can see Roman stuff all over i mean through my local park here there's you know there's roman pathways and like some like pet cemeteries and wow i mean there's all sorts i mean yeah and and people here take advantage of it so going back to what i was saying in the beginning you know i'm just always fascinated by anyone that says to me oh you know i grew up here and you know it's i want to live in so-and-so i'm like well you know, I you don't I don't think you actually know how amazing it is here. I think also there's I don't I don't think there's a plot 
But there's definitely no connection. You know, you're not brought up to kind of, I know we go on field trips and things like that, but I think there's so much culture and heritage here. And I think it's not being promoted, I think, as it should. And I know, you know, a lot of people blame funding and, and this, and we can't preserve this church. Like a lot of the churches are just, they're just not being kept and they're just falling apart. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't want to sound depressing, but I think that's why I just want to promote, you know, the beauty and just the, the diversity of, of what we have here, you know, historically, yeah, and so I think you're saying that these people who are like, why do you live here? You're, you're what you're thinking is like they're not connected to their own land and their own heritage and what's what's here, and Absolutely. that's why they don't understand how amazing it is. Yeah, and it, it it's it's sad. I mean, I think I I I think I brighten the eyes of some people, and they're like, oh, I didn't know that. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, you know, and definitely, you know, that's kind of what I had in mind for tonight. Um, there were other things that I, I had, but, um, like, I don't know if you've heard of the Cottingley fairies. No. It's quite a famous fairy story. Yes, that's tell right. Tell us the story. I do remember that. Tell us. But yeah, tell, tell, us. tell us the story. I do. I, I, it, this involved Please, photographs. Miss, tell us the story. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, it, it was, it was absolutely famous at the time. Yeah. Um, I mean, truly, because it was all, it was advocated by Arthur Conan Doyle. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's the one who kind of pushed this whole story into the forefront of, you know, all the journals and, you know, papers at the time in London, you know. Um, but basically the story goes as two cousins who lived in a place called Cottingley, which is near Bradford in West Yorkshire. Um and I think there was a little beck, a little stream and like a little woodland behind their house where they lived. Um, and these cousins obviously lived close by to each other. And I think um, the elder daughter's um, father was a, a keen photographer. And at, at that time, um, you know, that wasn't really that popular. You know, not many people had their own cameras. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, my notes with the actual date. So I think this happened. I know it's in. Um, I know I've seen the pictures. It's 1917. Okay. Yeah. In 1917. Yeah. A lot of you might have seen some of the pictures. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the daughter begged and begged and begged her father, who I believe was some kind of engineer, um, please, you know, can we use your camera? And he was like, no, 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 it's too expensive. And it's, you know, you'll break it and all this. Um, but these two cousins for years and years had said to their parents and friends, you know, we play with the fairy folk out back. Um, we play games and they appear to us and they tell us things and, you know, they hide, they can hide at will and they just, go into the hills and into the into the bluebell fields and they just disappear but they actually engage with us and of course the parents were like oh silly girls and <laughs> I, I think the mother was um reading Helen Blavatsky and things uh -huh. like that so I think the mother was a little bit more accepting of their stories but then didn't want the village to think that these little girls you know had maybe you know lost a few marbles or yeah you know, it, the times were very, they were very against anything like that. Um, kind of, you know, filling your head with silly ideas, you know. Um, so I think they just went along with it. The parents went along with it. And what essentially happened was um, the father finally allowed the girls to take this camera out into their little woodland. Um, and they apparently were gone for a half an hour and came back and the father didn't um, develop the film straight away. But when they did, uh, the parents were astonished to see that there were fairies in the picture. Right. And apparently the girls, it's it's kind of documented that the girls were like completely like shocked as well. Like, oh my gosh, you know, the fairies are actually in the picture. Come and look, come and look. You know, super excited. Um and it kind of eventually passed on 
through certain societies. And I think it was like 1920 by the time that Arthur Conan Doyle got wind of all this. And it just turned into this huge media, you know, kind of, you know, debate, you know, all these prominent people would like write responses and, and photographic experts would like, you know, wanted these negatives. And it was this huge kind of affair and people were turning up in this little village. Um, and the, but what happened was Arthur Conan Doyle got his friend, Mr. Gardner to interview the girls and kind of document what happened and verified the kind of integrity of their story. So it was just this huge thing. Um, Sounds very and, similar to what happens with UFO stuff today. Yeah. It's the same thing, right? You know, everybody, yeah. people get involved and they want the negatives and I want to see the raw foot, you know, the <laughs> yeah. camera yeah. data and yep. Yeah. And it might've been the first instance of this kind of thing because it was, it's kind of like fake it till you make it and make it till you fake it type yeah. scenario as well, where the girls genuinely believed. Um, but it actually, you know, sadly it did turn out that, you know, they had, and they did a really good job. Yeah, they were hoaxes, right? They were, that's what people say. I mean, I've seen the pictures. Yeah. they. Yeah. I mean, to our eye in 2021, it's pretty clear they're, they're not real. But yeah. back then, people weren't used to looking at photographs. Right. You know, it was kind of new to them and, and they were, they were really impressive. Um, so I have I have sent you one of the pictures, I think. But then Arthur Conan Doyle himself actually wrote a whole book um, about, you know, the entire event. Um, and it's fascinating. Um, and you can listen to that for free. Um, and that's called The Coming of the Fairies. Um, uh. But it's a fascinating tale. And again, you know, it's just one of those kind of Yorkshire mysterious legends you know, I see the pictures now. Yeah, we're looking yeah. at them. I'll, I'll put these in the show notes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. I know they're hilarious now, yeah. but back then, I mean, you know, prominent people were like, "Oh my god, they're so real! <laughs> Look at the the wings are fluttering, and you can see the movement, and and the, oh, it's amazing." Yeah. Um. So yeah, I don't actually know what happened. Maybe to his. It also it, it also reminds me of um, like poltergeist accounts. Like this happens with uh, right. you know there will be there will be activity reported, and then yeah. people come to try to document it, and the activity stops, and yeah. then people think, well, it never was happening in the first place, and then somebody will hoax activity trying to convince the investigators that it was real. Right. And then the whole thing is then, you know, decided the whole thing was a big hoax because they, right. you, know, you know, it's that, it's that, like you just said, you know, the make it till you fake it or fake it till you make it. Yeah. Well, it's um, like, it seems like pretty obvious it wasn't the girls that faked the photographs. Um, no, it was. Yeah. It was them? The, the girls did yeah. it. Yeah. They okay. did it. Yeah. Okay, well, then they, they did a really did good it. job. Yeah. They did. They did do a really good job. <laughs> I was and thinking I think, it was the, you know, it was the, de I mean, they've never used a camera before. Had they had developed film? I mean, you know, it seemed I, like it was the dad that did it. No, it was the little girls because the parents, like, thought it was real. Um, well, I didn't actually say in my tale, but the the daughter of the keen photographer, she did know what she was doing. Okay. All right. Because she kind of would watch her father. Okay. And, so they had plenty of experience developing film, I guess. Because, I mean, yeah. that's. Yeah. But they were they were excellent artists as well. Yeah. Because it's they are really tunes. well rendered. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So that, that's, um, yeah. Do you think but that think, they, do you think that they really did think they were interacting with fairies? And they, yeah, were, trying, they thinking. were trying to make a fake proof? That's what I'm talking about. Like with the with yeah. the poltergeist stuff, in some cases, it really looks like something was happening, and then they're yeah, unable yeah. to convince people, and so they hoax some kind of yeah. proof, right? Yeah. No, absolutely. And I think later in her life, I think, um, yeah, pardon me, I can't remember her name. I want to call her Elsie, the old, the elder daughter. Um, she was interviewed as an older, yeah, Elsie Wright and Francis Griffiths. Um, I believe this is just from memory, but I think she 
she was interviewed later in life and she absolutely, I think at one point she said, oh no, of course we didn't see fairies. But I think at that point they were so sick of all the attention. Yeah. Like this went on for the rest of their life. Yeah. Like it ruined families and lives. Like I've, you wow. know, there's, you, you still yeah. see articles now. My parents got a divorce because of the Cotton Lake Fairy scandal. <laughs> um, <laughs> Good grief. <laughs> but I think that Elsie in the end you know, I, I want to say on her deathbed just to make it sound cool, but she did absolutely say, no, we did. We did see them and we were friends with them. Yeah. And they were obviously really nice ones and not the evil kind. Right. So that's fascinating. But yeah, that, that poltergeist thing, again, I'm kind of waning. Um, well, we're almost done here. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Final thought. You know here. when you, you know when your mind just goes blank, and I know what it is. It's this creepy, creepy. I think it's the most documented poltergeisty house in like the world, and it's in Pontefract, West Yorkshire. And uh, they, there's films about it. Is it called the Black Monk Poltergeist? Hmm. I don't know. And there's yeah. Thanks, Kyle. <laughs> Kyle's looking it up. <laughs> it's in Pontefract, which is P O N T E F R A C T. Um, yeah, it's like I, I'm trying to think of what the films might have been called. Um, anyway, yeah, apparently, and you can go stay there. All right, go do it. You can do it for science. No, no, <laughs> do, it, do it for science. No way. Man. Yes, uh, at 30 uh, East Drive in East Yorkshire. Oh, eat. no, that, no, that's another one. That's another one. Is that what the film's based well, on, wait, though, I'm that just, one? I just saw that in the very beginning of the thing. It says, uh, the mysterious poltergeist known as the Black Monk of Pontefract. Yeah, Pontefract. That one is scary. Oh, okay, it just says the, it says, uh, blah, blah, blah. The Pritchard family moved into their new home at 30 East Drive in East Yorkshire. Right. I don't know. I didn't read the whole story. Yeah. No, that's a creep. If you if you like poltergeists, everybody, you should definitely look up that one. <laughs> it's super famous. But I think I was kind of more into ghosts and poltergeists when I was about 12. And then I kind of, you know, moved away from things like that a little bit more. And I don't really like I don't really like horror films that much anymore. Uh-oh. <laughs> Well, thanks for thanks, David Pilates. Yeah. It's just seriously, he really like. Yeah, thanks. David. So, are there are there strange missing persons cases in in Yorkshire? Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, Kyle. Yes, Kyle. But you know what? I really we should not I talk about those. I won't read about them. I won't. I I because I did at one point. Um, did they vanish in the moor? Near the serpent hole? <laughs> in the moors, yes. In the Yorkshire Dales, yes. You know, we have like three national parks here. Um, mm. uh, yeah. Um, but, you know, a lot of them go missing near the rivers. Yeah. You know, walking along the river, minding your own business, eating berries. Yeah. Bothering no um, one. Yeah, right. Yeah, I know. And, uh, you know, to be honest, I, I, I love listening. Like I, I listened to your episode a few weeks ago. Um, but, yeah, I won't read about the local stuff because it's just. Oh, that just, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. I'm all good. <laughs> just, don't plant, I, just don't plant any berries in your garden and you'll be fine. Oh my God. Oh, I have tons. I have 3,000 square feet of oh, you're doomed. berries and fruit, but it's fenced. Like, it's like I'm safe, hopefully. Yeah. yeah. And it's not in the middle of nowhere. It's kind of, you know, right. like, yeah. So it's okay. But no, I still think about it. I'm like, is anyone else here? <laughs> well, I'm picking the berries. I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. Well, Shannon, thank you so much for coming on telling the stories that was great and hearing your personal experiences with some of the sites you visited um keep doing it for science yeah you yeah know? for science you need to you yeah. need to do like uh three sunwise yeah. circles at dawn and see if you can open a portal to the other world yeah no absolutely i'll, I'll try to build courage but no it's been great thank you yeah thank you so much <laughs> thank you very much yeah love you guys yeah. always well
All right, you guys can get a hold of us, brothers of the serpent at gmail.com. Check out the website, brothers of the for all of the podcast related stuff, including the encyclopedia and the glossary and the snake scans, which is our merchandise store. Uh, join the pyramid scheme either through like one time payments through PayPal or through Patreon. We do have Patreon content. So if you sign up to Patreon, you will get access to the Patreon content there. Uh, give us reviews. That's really helped. I've been seeing some reviews rolling in. Thank you guys so much for that. Really appreciate it. It does help spread the show around. Uh, there is a Facebook group if you want to join that. We also have the Discord. There's a link to join the Discord on the website. So check that out. Uh, there's also the Library of the Serpent there. That and the Discord is managed by Jeff. So thanks very much to him. And also, as always, to History Shift, Brendan, who makes all of our YouTube videos. Thanks so much to him. He puts in a ton of work. Uh, so if you're watching this on YouTube, this was his work. And uh, yeah, Pod Doodles. He's been uh, working on some of our UFO episodes. So thanks to him. You can check him out, Pod Doodles, on YouTube or on Twitter. And uh, yeah, Soraya from Where Did the Road Go? Ben from Uncharted X and the guys over at Dry America. Uh, and all of you listeners out there, thank you so much. Yep. We love you guys. And I also want to give a shout out to Tony Roberts. Oh, yeah. Executive producer of this show. Hey. Uh, Brothers and Serpent Podcast with 100 bucks. Thanks, buddy. Donate to the Pyramid Scheme. Yeah. Yeah, you reminded me. I'm, I'm derelict in my duties here. We have uh, we have uh, two Ascended Masters. Oh. <laughs> on the Patreon. We, need, we, we don't need, have our Ascended Masters. got to make an Ascended, ascended master master Jingle. jingle. Um, but yeah, one of them is Frank... Who uh, he he you know he he raised himself from uh, Snake commander Force commander to uh, to ascended master <laughs> and uh, let's see thanks can, buddy yeah let's see if I can find the other one let me look through here is, I don't see it well there it is Zachariah another ascended master on on Patreon so thank you guys so much we really appreciate all the support there. And uh, yeah, we love you guys. Always have. Always will. Good night, Adamu. Get back to work. All right. <laughs> <laughs>